Well, welcome everybody to WordCast number 72. I got the number right that time. I'm very proud of myself. Um, and it's been a while, but we're we're back to talk to you guys and uh, doing it remotely because the responsible thing is to still stay home right now. So that's uh, that's what we're doing. But in reality, he's actually right behind me and I'm coughing on him. Clearly you're coughing right now. Everyone can tell by the footage. No, I just mute my mic when I'm coughing. Yeah, but they can still see you coughing. No, I also mute my video. <laughs> um, what are you on and where can I get it? Uh, I am on a controversy about B450 chipsets that ends up not really being a controversy, but we'll get to that part after. Well, it was a controversy. The controversy has been resolved. Right, exactly. So it's not a controversy anymore. And also, you should have said you were on a podcast. Oh, uh, you know what? I am on a podcast, but... I don't know. Is that like one word? A podcast? Okay, then. Okay. So what anyway, a great intro. Uh, so we're here to, to, to bring the tech news to you guys. That's what we're really good at. You know, we do it extremely consistently. We haven't ever missed a week, so it's uh, pretty pretty great. We're proud of ourselves for that. So anyway, the uh, AMD B450 chipset. Uh, some of you may have already heard about this, but there was a lot of controversy going around. Because uh, AMD was saying that they were not going to support uh, the or, well Zen 3 architecture Ryzen 4000 desktop on the B450 chipset. And uh, X470. Was, and the X470 chipset. Yeah, that's right. It was both of them. Uh, and that was really concerning to a lot of people because AMD had led an impression of, of the AM4 socket being uh, used for a long period of time, which is still true, but... They were not very clear about how they might change the chipset and keep the socket. Yeah, um, so for some background, both – so when they first launched um, Ryzen and they first launched the AM4 socket, they said that the socket would be supported through 2020. Now, to most people, that sounded like that they were going to essentially mean – or essentially allow you to buy any AM4 motherboard and use that board for the new CPUs through 2020. That's what yeah. most people thought it meant. That was what a lot of the hype was around it. AMD knew that was the expectation. It's not like this was just in people's mind. This was part of the core discussion about it. I specifically remember you being so excited about that and saying, like, this is how AMD is doing things so much better than Intel. Um, and I agree. That's an amazing thing. Too. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it was like a, a, it's an important feature. It was a great move that everyone was excited about. And then it was, what was it, 2018 that they had made the comment on Reddit? Um, I think it was 2018, yeah, um, it was 2018, where they had talked about BIOS issues with Intel products on Reddit and said that, you know, if they were to essentially artificially lock off CPU upgrade paths from motherboards just to uh, make the upgrade process neater, that would be um, like hostile to consumers um, yeah, and abusive yeah. to consumers. That was the hostile and abusive was what they said. That and so that was very. The term, yeah. Yeah, that was very concerning to people to now hear the announcement that Ryzen 4000 wouldn't work on AM4 motherboards, despite the fact that tech-wise, like, sure, there are other issues as far, and we'll get into those as far as BIOS and um, as far as other motherboard aspects, but, like, ultimately, they could make it work. It might not work as well. It might have issues, but they could make it work. And they said that it should you know, they shouldn't be cutting that off to make the upgrade process neater. So, yes, there are other issues, but yeah. per AMD's own words, they should Which, do it anyway. I will say, if we're all being honest, Intel does change the platform more often than necessary just for the point of profit, not even just for the point of making the upgrade process simpler. Like, if we yes. look at a lot of boards, it is literally just because of money. Yeah. Um, now, that being said, if you look at it, if they change the change the socket even if they just artificially lock it out but they say they changed it at yeah. least in that case compared to what would have happened if amd didn't change things and still is kind of happening we'll talk about it more but you run into the issue of like with with intel's path people know what motherboard to buy based on what cpu they're buying you just look for the yeah. compatible like that's it you just look for the compatible socket and you know it'll at least work uh, in fact, I think they've added dummy pins before just to to make it so that that lines up so that consumers yeah. don't make that mistake. And so that would have been a big issue with what AMD was doing, where if somebody knows some about building computers, let's say they built one 10 years ago and they haven't really paid attention, they don't dive into it, they just hear that 
Ryzen 4000 is amazing. And then yeah. they go, oh, I'm going to buy this board or this CPU and it uses the AM4 socket and I want to buy a cheap AM4 board. Oh, there's this B451 on sale. I'm not planning on overclocking. Who cares? And it didn't right. work. That could be a big problem. Yeah, no, it, it would it would it would confuse consumers. And let's be honest, in the PC space, people are already confused enough. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and so... it's especially made worse by the fact that, and I've talked with you about this, how like I, I would have had a bit less of a problem with it if B550 didn't get delayed. Um, yeah, but you're yeah, running into the issue these. of, for the last year, the current gen cheap chipset was B450. And if you bought yeah. the current cheap chipset and you bought, let's say, you know, the you know, Ryzen 3 CPU, and your plan was, when I have more money after the initial build of my computer, I'll upgrade to the next-gen CPU to get a bigger gain. Mm -hmm. Well, now you're kind of effed if they didn't make this change, which they are now doing, of supporting Zen 3 on the 400 series boards. Sort yeah, of. Yeah, so, so, so to be clear, the, for, the, the biggest issue that AMD talked about that does have some validity behind it is bio sizes and... Um, uh, when you add more CPUs to a support, or what I, I can't even talk. When you support more <laughs> CPUs on a uh, on the same chipset and the same BIOS, that that BIOS chip has to house the microcode for more CPUs, and so you're going to be using up more space on it. And those BIOS chips are only anywhere from 16 to 32 megabytes, which is not a lot of space. And especially considering how many fun graphics and crap that these uh, BIOS companies add to it, or these motherboard companies add to it, which is kind of ridiculous in my opinion. But, yeah, and um, then in addition to that, something I didn't even know until recently, but most of the Ryzen stack can't support 32 megabyte BIOS file sizes. Like, yeah. they can only uh -huh. read 16 megabytes, and so if they were to drop a BIOS update that, you know, required the board manufacturers to make it 32 megabytes, they actually couldn't run the CPU on that BIOS. Yeah, yeah. So that that and a lot of this just stems from the fact that 16 megabyte BIOS uh, chips are incredibly widely available. Uh, you probably have them in your TV. Uh, basically, any single person watching this has has been in contact with a 16 megabyte BIOS chip. They are just you can get them anywhere. They're everywhere, mm -hmm. and uh, that makes them really cheap. As we know, you know when you have a large quantity of something, it makes it cheaper to manufacture, and so you you have these 32 megabyte ones that don't sound like they should be that much more but they are significantly more expensive and then the other part that consumers tend to miss is what's a you know say dollar even though it's actually seems to be more than that but say it's a dollar more for those bios chips but it's like okay yeah but you move 300 million motherboards a year or maybe not that much 30 million that's 30 million dollars like that's <laughs> not an insignificant amount of money and uh even for these larger companies and so there's this thing where these companies don't like to put the 32 megabyte on there if they can avoid it when they're trying to cut costs to give you a board as cheap as possible um and so there was some validity here with with the fact that it makes more sense to use 60 megabyte bios chips for a lot of board manufacturers but yeah the things... the, the tech side makes perfect sense the issue yeah. is just with how amd set up expectations their marketing is what I feel like is my my issue here is AMD's marketing is like notoriously inconsistent and that's something that's bothered me is they'll <clears> promise <throat> things and it doesn't happen and it's not that AMD doesn't I don't like to say try to do the right thing their end goals profit of course their company but uh you know they they tend to be more on the consumer first open source first kind of front and when their marketing team promises something like that, you assume that's true. And when it's not, it's really frustrating. And that happens all too often with them. Uh, and I'm not here to say that Intel doesn't have the same problem. Uh, I do feel like NVIDIA maybe is a little better on that front where they, they don't promise something will be necessarily better than it is. They just overhype things like DLSS 1.0, which was not great, but they also didn't show screenshots that made it look like it was way better than what the actual end results were yeah um, i think in that case nvidia knew where the tech could get and they yeah, were just yeah essentially like so excited about that that they talked about that when they should have made it clear from the beginning that it wouldn't be there anytime soon yeah because yeah, they should have explained how long ai and, and machine learning processing takes i mean you, yeah. you train those these neural nets it takes a lot of time mm -hmm. um and then 
the other so, thing with this that I was going to add, um, yeah, when it comes to kind of how AMD set everything up, they the issue is both with how they set it up to consumers, but also how they set it up to board partners. Because like ultimately, MSI um, and their advertising was their fault. So for people that don't know, oh, yeah. MSI advertised their 400 series Max boards as being able to support all future AM4 products. Which was clearly they were remember. under the expectation that AMD planned on supporting those and that it might they expected to run into a BIOS size issue and they expected yeah. to have to cut off boards or cut off processors at some point like what is now happening with how they are doing this. Yeah, um, yeah. But it sounds like they, at least from, maybe AMD just never said anything to them directly at all. And maybe they were just going off of the consumer marketing, which would be even worse on MSI's part. And I also find that very unlikely. But but no yeah. matter what, how that was communicated to them, MSI was under the expectation that if they were willing to put in the work, like with what's now going to happen, and even with what happened with... Um, with Zen 2 on X370, because from my understanding, uh -huh. that was up to the motherboard makers, right? Uh, Yeah, it was up to the motherboard makers, but basically all of them did it, I believe. Yeah, uh, yeah, but it, MSI but... was under the expectation then that it would also be up to them, and so they committed to doing the work, essentially. And then they were then told by AMD when this became public, no. Yeah, yeah, and that, that, and so, that was for one of the root issues. And I mean, I, I will say it still falls on MSI. Ultimately oh, I agree completely. The, if, you, yeah, you don't you don't make if promises you're gonna, that you rely on somebody else for. And if you're gonna re if you're going to make that promise, you have a contractual agreement. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because they that's a big promise to make and stuff for this. Yeah. yeah, it's it's bad. Um, but AMD just needed to do a better job of communication. And I guess that even stands into the marketing ploy or market, not marketing ploy marketing side of things is like, I just feel like their communication is the issue. Like they don't always communicate to creators correctly. They don't always communicate to the community and they don't always communicate to apparently their partners very well. And it's that kind of stuff where they need to be a little more straightforward and maybe they need to hire more PR reps mm -hmm. as well as like business relation reps uh, or something like that, which uh, certainly they have the money to do that kind of stuff now. And um, that, because because that's something AMD has actually had trouble with, I feel like for a long time, even back to the FX series and stuff, is they just weren't always the best at communicating things. Yeah. Um, and that needs to be worked on. Obviously, the performance side of things and stuff is more important and was more important. And mm -hmm. uh, you know, Dr. Lisa Sue has helped with that. But I think now there needs to be a communication focus because Intel and Nvidia have both been pretty good about communication, at least on the private sector side of things, and to the to most of the creators you know there have been some big issues um but and they haven't always been the best at consumer stuff because they've kind of practiced a little bit of like predatory stuff but um mm -hmm. but in terms of business stuff there hasn't been as much of a breakdown that confuses partners and stuff like that that's always been mostly straightforward yeah um but, so real quick i think we should just go through the bullet points about how this is going to work from um amd's reddit post real quick so i'll just read through sure. this yeah. Um, just so people understand exactly, because it's not just as simple as if you have X four hundred or X four seventy or B four fifty, it's gonna work. Right. There's there's quite a bit. To um, yeah. <laughs> what they said was, um, so there's seven bullet points. Point one, um, we will develop and enable our motherboard partners with um the code to support Zen three based processors in select beta BIOSes for B four fifty and X four seventy motherboards. Um, yeah. And then two, these optional BIOS updates will disable support for many existing Ryzen desktop processor models to make the necessary ROM space available. Um, my guess with this, while they're not clarifying, all Zen 1 chips are out, and it'll be um, Zen 2 and Zen 3, so Ryzen 3000 and 4000 only. Yeah, yeah. Would be my guess. And no APUs at all, because APUs take up more code. Yeah, um, APUs take up a ton, so they, they just got to drop that support. Yeah. That makes sense. Um the select beta BIOSes will be uh, will enable a one-way upgrade path for AMD Ryzen processors with Zen 3 coming later this year. Flashing back to an older BIOS version will not be supported. Um, this is especially yeah. going to affect the resale market. Um, and if you've yeah. watched Gamer Nexus's video, that could be a really big deal for the Asian market where that's much more common than in the U.S. Yeah, um, yeah. And I mean, I, I can even just see that being a problem in general. It's like, we're going to see longer-term complaints about this for sure. Yeah. Like, that's just um, going to happen. But, but in in um certain parts of asia uh reselling motherboards is a much bigger deal than it is here 
And that's yeah. why I wanted to mention that is it can it can really affect the market there. Whereas here it will be an annoy I, I, it'll mess it'll fuck some people over, but it's going to really be a big deal in Asia. And that's there, one of the yeah. things that they had to weigh was you know do we risk pissing off enthusiasts in the U.S. or pissing off the aftermarket customers in Asia? There was no with yeah. what with the expectations they set up, there was no way to make both happy. No, no, right. And that, that's um, really what the stem of this comes from is it's still the expectation that's a yeah. problem. And, you know, because now we're going to face potentially longer term complaints and issues and people are going to be bothered by it. And yeah. AMD is just AMD is literally unlike what we have seen from Intel is they the community is pissed about something. So they're fixing it. Yeah. And like Intel, how long, how many years did it take Intel to finally start to solder the IHS again? It took mm -hmm. them forever and we begged and begged and begged for it. And they finally started yeah. doing it again. AMD flipped this over in the matter of about a week. Yeah. I also, I think that them making this so clear with how it's going to work and not being able to go back from the beginning um, yeah. does help with the resale aspect because now you then have to take that into account when you're doing the upgrade on your board. Like, am I going to resell it? If so, then maybe I shouldn't because that's going to affect the value of the board. Yes. Um, but at yeah. least you know that in advance. Um, and so I think that that's still fine. Um, you know, especially if we talk about the Asian market um, where reselling is bigger. Like if you're looking at doing this and you know it's going to affect your resell value, then maybe you just don't upgrade your CPU as soon. Yeah, yeah, I know that. I mean, that, that's, um, that's true. And then, um, so, um, to reduce the potential for confusion, um, our intent is to offer BIOS downloads only to verified customers of 400 series motherboards who have purchased a new desktop processor with Zen 3 inside. Uh, this will help ensure um, that customers have a bootable processor on hand after the BIOS flash, minimizing the risk a user could get caught in a no-boot situation. Um, I yeah, wonder exactly yeah. how that's going to work, because they can't hardware verify it because you can't boot the system yet until you can put the processor in so well, i wonder if they're just going to slip a code in the um in the box that seems like the best um, way to do it yeah they might they might go that direction you know i'm sure the bioses are going to end up publicly available in places where you can download them from you know who knows uh, guru 3d or something <laughs> yeah uh, I, i'm sure there's going to be some of that happening but I yeah, but I'm just saying, like, how their their official process is going to work. Gonna I'm just wondering. I bet it's going to be a code. Because, be a code. Yeah. That's that's the intelligent way to do it. And you know, uh, like, they're actually the this this is what I like is they it took them a matter of a week or two to to turn around a situation that the enthusiast community was really mad about, and then dump money into helping avoid confusion about it. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously this being as big of a deal as it was, a lot of people are aware of it anyway. Uh, enough people where if somebody is is trying to do a build, somebody they are referencing the build to probably has warned them about it. Mm -hmm. But they're still putting more effort into making sure that we don't have confusion on the ge general consumer side. And that right there is actually kind of impressive, if, if I'm being honest. that's yeah. I didn't expect them to go that far. I did actually personally expect, and I would have said this last week if we had gotten to the podcast then, I expected them to turn this around and make it so that it was something that was viable. Uh, uh, but putting extra effort into it is not something I would have expected. Yeah, the, the way I saw it, especially before this announcement, like I was, the way I was thinking about it was there's no way that they don't cave to the amount of pressure because while... AMD is growing, and at this point, AMD hardware-wise is at, like they have the advantage. Yeah. Ultimately, gen consumer, like general consumers, don't really necessarily know that. Don't really necessarily even sometimes care to, to look it up before they build their computer. You know how many people are still using Intel for brand new gaming rigs when it doesn't make sense? Yeah, um, yeah. and. Enthusiasts still really drive the rest of the market, and they're not at the position where they have that mainstream association with being the top tier. And so yeah. if they, especially right now, especially approaching Ryzen 4000, which might be the thing that finally, because like a lot of people know now that, you know, Ryzen 3000 is essentially better for pretty much every use case. Yeah, it's, it's basically it's across the board for, better. If what we're seeing for Ryzen 4000's rumors are true, then it's going to destroy Intel, and this will probably be yes. the thing that transitions them to being that, okay, we, everyone just knows to go with AMD. Um, but yeah, if you piss off right, all the enthusiasts at that transition, that's the worst possible time to piss them off, because they'll yeah. all give a big fuck you. 
Um, and so there was no way, especially right now, they didn't cave, I felt. Um, yeah. No, I, w- I was in the same boat. I felt like it was going to happen at some point. And, yeah. Um, I, I, I thought it would take a little longer than this, if I'm being honest. But Yeah. Um, um, and then, so they also go on to say, timing and availability of the BIOS updates will vary and may not immediately coincide with availability of the first Zen 3-based processors. This makes sense. Um, if I remember yeah. correctly, um, X, some X370 boards didn't get the updates to support um, Ryzen 3000 right away. No, yeah, I took some of them quite a while. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And then they also make clear that this is the final pathway they can enable for 400 series boards to add new CPU support. CPU releases beyond Zen 3 will require a newer motherboard. Um, Hey, that's fine, because that's next year. (laughs) Yeah. Personally, what I hope that they do is change the socket. I don't care if they make it AM4 Plus and put in fake pins. I honestly don't. I just, I think that, you know, they committed to supporting the socket through 2020. I think it'd yeah. be a really weird thing for the last, like the final year for them to have dropped support. But I also think it'd just be weird for the to keep AM4 going and just have this constant rotation of like, okay, which AM4 CPUs work with this board? No, I, I agree. Make and it, that's actually what they did with AM3 and AM3 Plus is it, yeah. wasn't even, it wasn't even dummy pens. It was the same pin out. They just put a plus in there. So it's really obvious. Yeah. And like, honestly, if they rebranded AM or uh, X570, to yeah am4 plus like that's fine yeah you just something to really identify it yeah um i just don't think they'll do that because of the fact that like my guess is whenever they do a socket change they're gonna want some a specific amount of years in mind for upgradability especially after this yeah, yeah um for sure. something that they can i don't think they'll commit to but something that in their head they're expecting um yeah, i don't think they'll yeah. give any sort of in, you know three four year out commitment after this whole no no i doubt it fiasco. Yeah. yeah it's gonna be yeah um and then we're seeing issues sometimes yeah um last thing they say is they'll continue to recommend customers choose a 500 series board which the way that they said that since this is talking about zen 3 like obviously they'll continue to say that for now yeah um but like are they gonna are they gonna drop uh 600 series am4 boards or are they going if because like if they're going to move sockets next year then i don't think it makes sense to drop a 600 series personally like what features are you really going to add that are going to make that much of a difference and if you're one year out then selling you know having motherboard manufacturers invest in a new chipset and and selling brand new boards at a new you know higher price or equal price but like unable to take advantage of price drops only to drop the socket next year i i uh, um unless they can make I, the socket I like i agree but i also think that it depends on what zen 3 ryzen 4000 desktop is really going to entail in terms of yeah. power requirements and other stuff like that there might be a reason why they like why it makes sense to launch the newer stuff um yeah i'm just saying like if if, if there is i'm wondering what that is because like if there's not a really important reason then i feel like it almost just makes more sense to just let the 500 series ride out the um end of the socket yeah i mean i i I, okay so i wouldn't be surprised if they do either or um Mm -hmm. i i don't think we're gonna see a 600 series that would be my prediction but i also could see why they might do it so I, i don't know it's hard to say for sure but um but on some more AMD news that's maybe a little bit more positive for some people, uh, some new chips came out. So this right here uh, is why we were kind of saying they should have just gone ahead and launched the 500 series at least alongside these chips. Uh, but AMD announced the Ryzen 3 3100 and the Ryzen 3 3300X. Uh, I don't really know if the X was necessary on that AMD because <laughs> we don't have other ones there. But anyway... Um, so their no, budget, extreme, yes, yes, <laughs> their budget quad core ones, uh, quad core chips, and they're actually looking pretty amazing. And in fact, all the reviews have been very positive around them. So the Ryzen 3 3100 is a hundred bucks for four cores and eight threads. Has a 3.6 gigahertz base clock and 3.9 boost. Uh, I'm not sure if there's been a lot of testing regarding precision boost overdrive and stuff like that. I can't remember if it's included on these. I'd have to double check, but uh. Uh, anyway, the 3100 is two, two core CCXs and a single CCD. 
Um, what that means is there is actually going to be some some core to core latency because their two cores are these separate modules. So there's a, a fabric that they have to cross there. Uh, whereas the Ryzen 3 3300X is actually uh, a single four core CCX in a single CCD. And so that's going to give it a little bit better performance anyway. And it's only $120. It's also a four core eight thread, but it has a 3.8 gigahertz boost and a 4.3 or 3.8 base, 4.3 gigahertz boost. And I don't know, 20 bucks. I almost feel like, why would you buy the 3100? <laughs> yeah. Um, like, it, cause you get that, the next, that added latency, uh, along with the lower clocks just makes the 3100 a less sensible item. And when you look at the benchmarks, it is semi significant for $20. I feel like, you know, if you're spending this little amount of money on a PC, if it is for gaming or production work, you mm -hmm. probably aren't planning on replacing that chip right away. <laughs> uh, Honestly, so I feel like most of the people that are going to end up buying this aren't the people that are going to look at benchmarks, like specifically the yeah. 3100. They're just going to see that it's also a 4-core 8-thread and it's only 0.2 gigahertz base difference, and they'll be like, yeah. okay, I'll just get that one. Yeah, yeah, that could be. Um, but either way, I mean, they both actually are ending up as really good options so yeah uh they both uh generally beat the the similarly priced uh intel 9400f although the 3100 is is very close it falls a little behind sometimes but it's it's pretty much neck and neck whereas the 3300x just straight mm -hmm. up beats it and that's a four core four thread so there is a little bit of a okay well of course it beats it because it has more threads but it, again when you're looking at price parity that's the item to compare it to uh, and the bigger news for a lot of people is the 3300X and the 3100 pretty much across the board beat the 7700K, which was mm -hmm. considered an amazing gaming chip and an amazing production chip at the time. Now, uh, of course, things have changed. 8 gigabytes of RAM is no longer the recommendation for a gaming system, and 4 cores is no longer really the recommendation for a gaming system except laptops. So, you know, if you can, still try and splurge for a 6-core uh, and get that extra RAM, you know, for example. But yeah. on the ultra budget, it is going to be capable of at least playing most games. You shouldn't run across the games that just don't start on it because uh, we saw that with some of the dual core parts. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's a it's just all around great to have much better budget stuff. I'm very glad that they're dropping these. Oh yeah, I mean, the more of that, the better because the budget stuff benefits everybody. It's and mm -hmm. I don't just mean like inherently; I mean directly. So you have the people that can that, that can't afford the more expensive equipment, and so they go with the budget stuff. And better budget stuff is just better for people that are either not looking to spend a lot or don't have a lot to spend. But the other thing is enthusiasts like the budget stuff because it's fun to play with it. Gamers Nexus did uh, extreme overclocking on the 3100 with liquid nitrogen. It's fun to buy cheap hardware that you don't worry about hurting or you need a small use case for. You want a really small form factor PC that only has uh, you know, a single cooler or something like that, like a really small budget cooler. And so a lot of enthusiasts or people that just have more money to buy things like this are going to buy things anyway just to toy with or whatever <laughs> else or, or to build their grandparents a system or whatever it may be. And so they end up selling them to most people. You know, I mean, like, sure, I've got a 3970X here as my main desktop rig, but it's like I also do have a 1600 and um, I'm going to be getting hopefully a 3600 at some point. And, uh, oh, there's another one I have that I, oh, and I have a 4670K and a 4790K still in use. Like these, <laughs> these smaller core count chips are still fun to use for things. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, and then another thing too, is that the better that the low end hardware is, the better for, especially for gamers overall. And this is something, you know, I'm sure yeah. we'll talk about more once we get, um, a, you know, we, once we do a wordcast closer to some console announcements, uh -huh. um, but as the the bottom tier moves up, game developers can plan for and develop around that, and take advantage of the hardware better. You know, if if they can set a base requirement of a good high quality quad core chip, then that means that they can change game mechanics and they can change, um, you know. Um, level design and things like that yeah. same thing with you know once everyone moves to ssds they can change how games are literally made to be played by having better base hardware and the cheaper and better that base hardware like that low-end hardware is then the easier it is for them to justify doing that without cutting off a big segment of gamers 
Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. And actually, that you, you make a good point there. And, um, well, I guess I don't have that much to add to it, but I agree <laughs> with you. I just agree with you. <laughs> um, the, the, the more the more budget stuff we get, the better, as long as it's actually good budget stuff, of course, not just yeah. chop things that are cheap. Uh, it, it just is beneficial across the board for everybody in every segment of the market. So yeah. Um, and then for our final NVIDIA topic or AMD topic, we can talk about NVIDIA dropping Intel. So it's also <laughs> an NVIDIA topic. Yes, it's all of them. Oh. <laughs> it's literally all of them. It is literally all of them. Yeah. So the only people, the only like major CPU thing not involved is ARM. You know what? That's that's true. But then it's not x86, so it doesn't count. It's still a CPU. Yeah, yeah, just as much as NVIDIA's GPUs are CPUs. I mean, NVIDIA made CPUs, too. Yeah, I know they did. They made ARM CPUs. Um, I know. So, yeah, I, I was actually not at all surprised about this. Uh, in fact, I was surprised that the Apple Mac Pro didn't do this. <laughs> um... So I am is... not at all surprised until USB 4 comes out. Apple will not yeah. change because they do not want to drop. Um, no, I, I know, I know, I know. I, I but, but I'm just clarifying for everyone that's watching. That's the whole reason that they're sticking with Intel. It's what not because mean, it's better. Everyone that's watching, nobody's watching. Nobody People will us. be. Nobody watches us. Somebody will. Your mom will. <laughs> I don't think no, she, she watches won't. this podcast. No, she won't. Your I'm mom not will not watch this. Talk over her head. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, anyway, NVIDIA uh, dropped uh, Intel for their GGX server units uh, in place of Epic Rome, which isn't surprising at all. Uh, Epic Rome is better, period. AMD is better on the server market, period. Uh, there is There is not a question on the server market right now. And so it just makes sense for NVIDIA to go this route. They're looking for the best of the best compute. And so they're going to go with whatever makes the most sense for them. Yeah, it's a but, good choice. It's yeah. just something that's kind of interesting. It's interesting. And I mean, I think the most important thing for us to take away here is that NVIDIA is making these uh, like dense supercomputers in Jensen's oven. Yes. So, yes, he is. That's actually yeah. how they're made, clearly. That's how they're made. So that's the important thing to take away from here, is that you could actually make a $400,000 supercomputer in your oven. No, you no, 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 no. Most people don't have the money Jensen does. He has a special oven. You can't just buy his oven. It didn't look like a special <laughs> oven to me. I don't know. No, he took the shell of a normal oven and put NVIDIA oven technology in there. That, oh, that altered okay. visuals. So it's in like such an way. AI deep learning oven. Yes. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. It's got like it's got a uh, uh, tensor elements, right? <laughs> yes. So that's clearly. how that's how it makes this stuff. Okay. Yeah. A lot of fun. A lot of fun. Well, I will let you take the lead on this uh, new subject by introducing you as taking the lead. Okay then. <laughs> um, so for our next topic, we have um, some leaks coming about a new product from Apple. Um, now. For those that don't really follow Apple News, which I'm sure is a lot of people that watch this channel, because generally I feel like a lot of PC enthusiasts also prefer Android. Like if you, unless you're I... just a PC enthusiast for gaming, like if no, you're if know. you like, like PC for like the the openness versus Mac, then you I probably like also like that Android. Would watch the a build of a Proxmox virtualization server probably buy Apple products most of the time. Yes, I agree. Yeah. Um, but so so if you don't follow Apple, even if you have Apple products, if you don't follow Apple leaks, you probably don't know who John Prozer is. But he's been leaking a lot of Apple stuff recently. Clearly, he has some high up contact. Um, I'm pretty sure he was the one that leaked the pricing of the new iPhone SE well he's before leaking, it got he confirmed. See a doctor. Yes. Um, but he he's been leaking a lot of stuff about Apple, and he hinted that. Um, some he'd be getting some details about apple glasses and uh he dropped a bombshell so if his leaks are true which again they might not be he's been so accurate Apple's so far but bombshell, not who glasses? knows stop um <laughs> if what he's leaking is true which again might not be then what he's saying is that currently apple is expecting to launch the glasses at 499 plus the cost of your prescription. So let's say 600 for people that have prescriptions if you don't have any like bifocals or anything crazy because we assume that it'll be relatively expensive lenses. So I'm assuming the prescription will be a hundred bucks. 
Yeah. Um, and then with that, the at least the first gen of these will be very much like the first gen or Gen Zero Apple Watch, which was that the Apple Watch Gen Zero didn't do any processing on the watch. It just sent the data to the phone. The phone processed it, sent it back. Uh, that's how this is expected to be done, which makes sense because you need these things to be thin and light if they're going to look like normal glasses. And um, there's been a lot of like rumors and leaks that these were going to look like very futuristic. Let's be real. No, Apple is not yeah. going to do that. That's, that's, um, I don't that's know why people thought that in the first yeah. place, let alone the fact that no like credible leaker has said that. Watch it. Watch it have a neck strap with the battery pack, though. That'd be hot. I think I think I would wear that. Yeah, just, um, just the battery, not the glasses. Yeah. Um. So these are not expected to have a camera for privacy reasons, but they are expected to have a uh, lidar, and they are essentially taking data from um what the current iPad Pros that have the lidar sensor process, and essentially using the machine learning from that to improve the lidar that they're going to be utilizing on these glasses supposedly. Mm -hmm. um, and with that, um, Apple is apparently designing their own QR codes. Um, initially, when the leak came out about that, it seemed like it was just Apple being Apple and designing something proprietary. Yeah. But now it seems like they might actually be doing it to make it more readable by a LiDAR sensor rather than a camera. Because QR codes are yeah. designed to be read by cameras, not a LiDAR yeah. sensor, which sends out... Si so however Apple's doing it, they're trying to have some way to, without a camera, be able to read QR codes so that you can do more in-depth AR um, connectivity like you would be able to scan something and get information. Right, right. Um, so that makes sense. Um, apparently, both lenses will have displays in them, and um, you'll only be able to see it from the inside. Like, nobody will be able to tell what you're looking at. Mm. From from the outside, obviously, if they come and look at it from the back it's angle, be they really might be able hard to see to a little bit. Recognize as a glass hole, then. Yes, yeah. um, that is the point. I mean, you'll see the little well, like lidar no sensor, but yeah. Um, and yeah. then for gestures, apparently there'll be two ways to do gestures on this. Both like some kind of gesture on device, probably swipes and taps, um, and then also because it's got lidar, apparently you'll be able to do some kind of gesture in front of your face with your hand. So we're going to see people like walking around like this in, in the street, running into cars. I mean, if that's how they choose to do it, there's a reason that there's both gestures. Like if I'm at home, yeah. I might swipe through something like this. Whereas if I'm like, you know, walking around, I might go. Yeah, yeah. Well, actually knowing Apple, they would probably try to put something in there that uh, doesn't let you use hand gestures if you need to see where you're going. <laughs> that's actually probably true. Although, yeah. I, I mean, I guess they could probably tell with a LiDAR sensor. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Or, or and, even um, just accelerometer. I mean, they could tell if you're walking, you know, basically. Yeah. Um, what's interesting, too, with the hand gesture thing is I wonder if they're going to be able to achieve the granularity that um, Soli did. Um, for those that don't know, Soli was Apple or was Google's um, special, like, special projects divisions, yeah. um, radar tech that allows them to do things like actually being able to tell that you're just rubbing your hand together to change the volume. Um, it's something it that's in the current... Like well. <laughs> it's in the Pixel 4. Some of the features were kind of garbage. Some of the features yeah. people really liked, like, for example, it could tell that you were reaching for your phone, and so if you were reaching for your phone while a call was coming in, it could, like, adjust the volume based on how close your hand was. Yeah. And so as you grab it, it silences it because you're grabbing it and you don't need to keep hearing the audio. You clearly know it's ringing. Yeah, um, yeah, that type of thing. Um, so apparently, Google is going to drop that from their next gen Pixel. So clearly, people didn't utilize it that much. Um, well, I mean, it's also Google, so we know they kill things that people utilize a ton too. So. <laughs> That's true. So actually, maybe it was utilized a lot. In fact, I would I would be willing to bet that if Google's killing it, it was probably used more than their other products. Yeah, <laughs> um, that's sadly probably true. Which is why um, they have yet to kill off uh, Stadia. Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> Everybody hates it. And then we have yeah. Hangouts, which is just like, as people stopped using it, because Google said they were shutting it down, they stopped shutting it down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Whatever. Um, and then um, sunglasses will eventually come for the Apple Glass, but apparently, um, and this makes sense, it's hard to get the display working on tinted glass. 
Yeah. So it's going to be a while. Um, expected to be a couple years out at least. Um, and then the announcement will likely happen at whatever the first in-person Apple event that they can host is. Um, apparently, they were planning on announcing this in September, with it still planning on not launching until late 2021 or early 2022. Yeah. But they wanted it to be like the Apple Watch, where they could announce it and then release the product way later, which in this case makes sense because who knows, maybe there's something that consumers will be upset about, consumers will be really happy about, want to see improved or tweaked. And... Um, Doing that before a first gen product launch makes a lot more sense and is probably much more important than doing it before like a gen five. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean what's probably gonna happen now is they're gonna have the announcement about it closer to launch date though by like a lot. Yeah, it's it's, it's expecting um from what we've heard, probably the event that they think they'll be able to do it in is probably March of next year. Yeah. Which gives them eight to 12 months before release, which is still enough to make some changes, but not as not much. Not as much, yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah. who knows, though? I mean, if since they're planning on doing it so far out in advance, maybe come the March event, they just don't announce a release date. They say, or they'll say coming early 2022, and that could mean March, that could mean before June. Who knows? Yeah. Um, we'll see. It just depends. A prob- it probably just depends on feedback as to when they'll want to drop it. Um, I, I, I do hope it's actually good. That's my only thing, because I got yeah. incredibly hyped around the leaks of Google Glass. I was really excited for it, mm-hmm. and I was in high school at the time, not making a lot of money. I was trying to save up money <clears throat> to purchase it, and then I was like, oh, this sucks, so I never yeah. did it. Um, I mean, obviously, you're not going to get one because you don't have an iPhone, but overall, well, I mean, what do you think good of... Enough, maybe I would be willing to switch. Probably not. I mean, I'm you know the guy that buys things like this still. So probably not, but if they are, really you gonna get that LG that rotating phone? No, but I am planning to get the Surface Duo. Yeah. So you heard that the battery we'll is gonna be that. ass on it, right? Yeah, that's, we're gonna talk about that later. I do have that okay, cool. talking point. So. Um, but yeah, what do you what do you think of this? I, I, okay, so I, if they can pull it off, I think it's awesome. Mm-hmm. This is what we've been wanting for a long time. This is what's been in Hollywood movies for a long time. I think it could be really beneficial. Um, you know, it it. it it both keeps people more connected and less connected at the same time. And I kind of like mm-hmm. that about it where people can still interact with the real world, but have something there that keeps them connected, but it may help people from checking their phones so frequently. I mean, I, I literally just looked at mine cause it lit up. Right. And being mm-hmm. able to, uh, you know, focus on something else and see a little notification come in and know that you can ignore it. Like mine was mm-hmm. an email I don't care about, but I had to take my attention way to look at it. And I wouldn't have had to, if I had something like this, but on the, on the contrary, it could also be where somebody is, you know, reading a text from somebody while staring them blank in the eye. And yeah. that's frustrating. And that was something we saw with Google Glass as a problem, but not enough people bought it where it didn't really become like a big social issue. Well, and then the other but thing with could. Google Glass was you could generally tell that there was light or that people were moving their eyes to look up to the corner, whereas this is going to be this both lenses right just there. right in front of your face. Yeah, yeah. So that that's my question. And then, um, you know, obviously it's got to go through approvals and stuff like that. Uh, I don't know if it's going to... What approvals? FDA and stuff like that. No, if they're, it doesn't. If they're using it would only need light. Yeah, if they, if they are, but we don't know what they're doing. It, it's very possible that they're doing tech similar to um, North, which is not projector based. Yeah, I guess that's true. I guess that's true. I know something Google's looked into heavily is projector based projecting the light into your eyes, things yeah. like that that you have to watch out for. And then of course, I don't think the- Apple's going to go that route personally. That just doesn't seem very Apple. Well said. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I mean, maybe, maybe not. I I guess. My other thing is I can see this being a concern for distracted driving. Um, and oh, for sure. In there to mitigate that because that's been that was a problem with Google Glass as well. Mm-hmm. And again, Google Glass got a ton of press coverage and not very many people bought it, guys. I mean, it was fifteen hundred well, dollars. Most people it, couldn't most either. People Initially, couldn't. Yeah, exactly. it was only for certain people. Right. It was for certain people. And even when they opened it up a little more, it was still for you. It was hard to get into. It took a while to get. <laughs> it was fifteen hundred dollars. It was ugly. It didn't do very much. Um, and so this being potentially actually available to most consumers is a little bit of a concern for safety things. But yeah. But if they can pull it off, I'd still think it's really cool. I still think it's in the direction of what I want to see tech going. And it would be one of the <laughs> first products from Apple for a long time that I feel genuinely, like, really impressed by the technology behind it behind it, and not just the refinement behind it. Right? Yeah. Um, um, 
I will also say if we look at um, timetables, like, so let's say this drops early 2022. Yeah. Most people aren't going to buy a Gen Zero, even if it, $499 actually sounds way cheaper than I thought it was going to be. I was thinking yeah, yeah. launch one was going to be a grand, but Apple is pushing more towards cheaper stuff. So 499 well, theory, actually seems I mean, the, just because the SE was cheap, they might still come out with, you know, $1,500 phones. <laughs> but, well, yeah. But I'm, I'm just saying, like, for all we know, they could do like they did with the Apple Watch and have a fucking edition model that's a grand and looks different. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and also, maybe four ninety nine is their end goal price, and the launch model will be more. Who knows? Um, but even if it's four ninety nine, I just don't think that many people are going to buy the. I'm going to call it a Gen Zero because I'm going to. It's kind of like the the Apple Watch Gen Zero, so I'm just going to treat it as such. Um, yeah, I tried so forgotten that I, was considered the Gen Zero too. <laughs> yeah, um, so I don't think very many people are going to buy it that first no, year. Probably not. Um, and so let's say it takes five years for half of iPhone users to start buying them. Probably it'll take longer because most people don't wear glasses and a lot of people are going to be hesitant to wear glasses that they don't normally wear. Whereas yeah. wearing a watch, if you didn't previously wear one, is not really that big of a deal. It doesn't literally change how you look to everyone. You know what um, I will say, though? Wearing a watch, and I don't just mean this for me, but it is, it is a big deal for people that, uh, that you know, type 16 hours a day, which is still a surprising number of people. But uh, Yeah. But I'm I'm just saying like you can take that off when you're typing, yeah, but um, and glasses, I mean, you can take the glasses definitely. off. But like if it's it's such a different change, especially if sunglasses aren't coming for three, four, who knows, however many years it takes for them to get them ready and working to the quality that they well, want. Just wait till they decide they want to do transitions, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and so let's say we, you know, let's say early 2022 is when it drops. Sunglasses don't come out until 2025, 2026, and yeah. then. This isn't, uh, you know, this isn't even adopted by half of iPhone users until 2026, 2027. We could realistically be in a position where self-driving um, taxi services are so cheap that they're an option for a lot more people and not like less people need cars. Yeah. And so the distracted driving thing could be less of an issue by the time this is a mainstream product than people will think when it's ready if self-driving is ready soon which places like tesla seem to be getting close i mean they they, they seem to be getting close but they've also always been talking about getting close i mean but uh, tesla's and... just recently dropped um and it works pretty well for being dropped out for just having dropped um like automatic start uh or automatic stopping at stop signs and stoplights and stuff which is a huge yeah. thing that they needed so while that um, is a huge thing elon uh talked about that in 2019 as a beta that they were using in his car that would be ready in under six months and that was like January when in 2019 yeah uh, again I'm, I'm going off of not what they're saying i'm going off of where the tech is yeah yeah and I, I the guess so. tech to me shows like again i don't think it'll be ready this year next year but let's say it's you know drops end of 2022 at with approval in some states as like full self-driving yeah with the way that tesla has talked about its plans for its taxi service and with what they're doing as far as when you lease a car you don't have the option to to keep the car you don't have the option to re-sign the lease for the car nothing tesla is keeping that car so they can put it in their taxi service yeah tesla is going to whenever this gets ready immediately be able to drop a much bigger fleet than anyone realizes or not anyone realizes but then that anyone is like actively thinking about unless you're really thinking about well, self-driving I, I i i think what you mean to say is that that before what, what <clears throat> that like bigger than anyone except you realizes your exclusive information on this N no and not that's at all important no if you think about it with what tesla said you'll know this but most people don't care what tesla says about its self-driving no I, i'm 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 aware i'm saying yeah. that, that you're the first person to know this because you're a genius so now everybody no. knows it because they watch not even podcast. close but i'll take the credit i guess um that's sure. what i was looking for okay um but yeah so i mean you have you know their entire lease fleet you have all of the cars that they'll be making after that point because tesla has even said once they have full self-driving they're going to skyrocket the cost of the self-driving option and eventually their cars because all of well, their yeah, car I mean... production is going to go towards their self-driving fleet you also have every car that has full self-driving capable hardware 
that any owner might want to make some extra money on, be able to put it into the fleet. And yeah. so you will, whenever it's ready, you know, who knows, maybe it's five years from now, whenever it's ready, Tesla will be able to immediately drop a fleet. Whereas when Google gets theirs ready, they'll have to build the fleet. And that's well, the big I mean, difference. So that, that, that's a good point is having stuff readily available. And I mean, I guess. And, uh, you yeah. Know, and you have the person. company that is seemingly furthest ahead software wise that, that we know of publicly. Um, yeah also be the ones that are ready to drop a physical fleet at any moment. Yeah, and that that right there, I mean, then it's just a matter of consumer adoption and consumer viewpoint, right? Like, I would be yeah. willing to use a self-driving taxi service and not own a car. I would be fine with that. But, uh, you know, some people wouldn't be. So we've got to see then that. Yeah, what kind some of people definitely right? won't be. I think that what we're going to see is a lot, um, a lot of sentiment around being around people is obviously changing with what's going on and how yeah how lasting that is you know if it's something that goes away right when this ends versus if it's something that goes away two years after this ends and people are a little more comfortable because like even if you get vaccinated who knows if the you know vaccines work in the vast majority of people that get them but sometimes yeah. they don't some people are going to be wary about things until we know the virus is dead and even then people are going to be more cautious and so yeah, if that sure, sentiment sure. lasts that might make people more willing to try it who knows potentially yeah yeah I don't know. Um, and if, also if the idea Tesla those can, might be more incentive to just buy a car <laughs> if they can afford it, you know? Um, yeah, so, but the, yeah. and again, the, I don't think Tesla, when they first drop their fleet, will be at this point. But the goal of the Tesla fleet is to have so many vehicles that it is cheaper to do this than it would be to buy and own a car. Yeah, right, right. Which, I mean, I think eventually we're going to be in that in that realm, which, uh, which yeah. again, I'm personally happy about. Because if we can start eliminating uh, uh, parking congestion, which is a significant issue, um, then we have more area for infrastructure and other stuff like that. The issue with that, and this is not really <laughs> relevant to the Apple Glass, um, but hey, you can okay. run into the issue Why of, um, yeah, you can run into the, well, they don't use a whole, they, they mostly focus on vision with Tesla, but you I can know. run into an issue of, um, you still need a place to have the self-driving car be when it's not driving or charging and if you get rid of parking what you can do you can free that up for parks or for buildings or whatever but then you run into the issue of a constant rolling fleet and that means constantly burning more electricity and even if you have all clean energy you're going to have to store a lot of energy if you have a constant rolling fleet and the cars can on their own operate as battery storage but if they're yeah, constantly yeah. burning electricity then they kind of lose that effect well i so i didn't necessarily mean a constant rolling fleet i more so meant that like we can reduce parking in um uh like at actual stores and stuff like that oh and okay downtown, yes. where they could have like oh here's the tesla parking garage that holds six thousand mm -hmm. cars you know <laughs> yeah uh and then there's no parking everywhere else and yeah you know potentially even moving into the realm of some areas being able to have an extra lane or two uh mm -hmm. which helps with traffic congestion which is another huge issue right so yeah. I, I, I think all in the that end part, yes. is Apple Glass is going to fix traffic congestion is what we're really going to say. <laughs> yes, clearly yeah, that's, that's that is cool. Apple's plan. Apple has dropped their plans for working on a car, and they've decided we can fix all car issues with glasses. I think they can fix literally any issue with glass. Yeah. Just, just e I mean, except glasses, glass except the sunglasses. Glass cars, glass spaceships, they can do all of it. Mm -hmm. Except the sunglasses. That'll take a few Except years. the sunglasses, yeah. <laughs> so, like, you can have a glass spaceship, but it's not tinted. Yes, which yeah. would be really, really bad. No, I think it's I think it's fine. I think it's okay. No, you would die. <laughs> no, you wouldn't. Not according to me, at least. You'd go blind. What's blind? Tough. Uh, oh, man, I was trying to think of a good segue in relation to blind, but I couldn't. I was going to say, like, Epic <laughs> is blind, too, but I just, it didn't click. No. Um. All right, so I'll just... Uh... Epic is telling people how blind they are of how great Unreal Engine is. <laughs> but no. then we're not even going to talk um, about Unreal Engine yet. <laughs> not yet. Um. All right, and then... Um, so E3 was supposed to have been coming up, but obviously <sighs> isn't with everything that's going on. Um, yep. So gaming news is very different this year. And instead of a week of all of the gaming news all at once, um, or I guess a week in February, March for GDC, and then a week in June for everything else, and then a week in Ju 
July, September yeah. for Gamescom. We have Summer Games Fest, IGN Summer of Games, all these different things that essentially mean the same thing. Gaming news is going to trickle all summer, which personally I'm very happy about. I know some people prefer the like dedicated week of just all the gaming news, but I like just like every yeah. day popping into my feed and seeing something actually interesting about gaming. I completely agree. I don't like it when like I, I have like feeds that are kind of specific to computing, but whenever <clears> E3 <throat> would happen, all the computing news is suppressed and I have trouble finding it because everybody's yeah. talking about the games. So I, I really like the trickle out of information better. And it's, uh, I don't know, I, I, I've liked the way the PC realm and tech realm have kind <laughs> of done that for a long time where it's like, here's a new product. Here's a new product. Here's a new product yeah. several different times a year. Yeah. So with that, um, probably every WordCast that we do this summer will have some gaming news. Obviously, some weeks will be more eventful than others, but yeah. and this is a pretty big one um, just because of the tech that we're going to talk about. But Epic has announced three major things, um, the first of which is not directly related to their engine. This is actually something that works on any engine. Um, they specifically advertise Unity, Unreal, Lumberyard, and even like super small engines like Godot. But any engine you can bring the code over to use this with. Um, essentially, what they're launching is Epic Online Services. And this is a tool to give any game developers, big and small, the ability to implement crossplay much easier. Um, so, this works currently with Switch, PS4, Xbox, and PC. However, they are also working to add iOS and Android soon. Um, and this will allow for cross platform lobbies, matchmaking. Um, actual matches, leaderboards, cross-platform progression, um, all of it. And it's completely free for developers. So if you're making an indie, uh, you know, multiplayer game, something, you know, a unique experience like Journey, you know, now Journey could potentially add this and be cross-platform, which would be really cool. Um, the next big multiplayer AAA game, much easier for them to add cross-platform. It's just all around good for every gamer, pretty much. But Epic's bad. Yes, Epic is is very bad. Um, you know, they use their money to do things like this next announcement, which is uh, that they are changing how they charge for the game engine. Um, so previously, the way that they charged for the game engine was um, it was free to download, free to make your game. And then they charged you, I think it was um, royalties based on if you made more than $3,000 per quarter. So pretty much if you released a game and it sold a decent, like, you know, even a small amount, you'd probably end up having like a successful game, right? Not even Basically. that. I mean, you could spend two, three years making a game, drop, you know, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 and then make a thousand dollars a month and have to pay royalties. Yeah. Um, and so it was just essentially, if you were, if you were making actual, like if essentially if you were making money and it was more than just like an art project, you were paying for it. Yeah. Um, well that's completely changed. So now, uh, it's still free to download, still free to make your game, uh, free to release the game, and uh, they only charge you if you make more than a million dollars in a year, and they only charge you uh, the royalties on the million and first dollar and above. So yeah. most indie games, even ones that actually do pretty damn well, it is now completely free. That right there is pretty amazing. So, so... Just to make sure that the audience understands, because this was something I had a point of confusion with, is Unreal Engine is associated with Epic. They yes. Are Epic. So just Unreal just Engine is is and has and always has been made by Epic. Yes. Yeah. So that, it that's is a something core. Epic yeah, wasn't a... as big of a brand until things like Fortnite and the Epic Game Store. So everybody mm. just called it Unreal Engine and kind of assumed that was the name of the company, right? <laughs> so yeah. I wanted to make sure that was clear there. Um, and I mean th this right here really just oh, tells me one other thing i need to add uh they backdated this to january 1st of this year so if you're a game developer who released your game two months ago three months ago this still applies to you okay so that that is super awesome you know i i think all of this just really tells me though how um just horrible for the market epic is they just <laughs> don't care about gamers or game developers and yeah. that right there is just is unfortunate no, but but yeah. but in reality, I mean, this, this is just this is amazing. I'm I'm surprised by this personally. I didn't expect them to come out and do this. Uh, obviously, as a company, their goal is to make money one way or another. But thinking on the long term, having more people and more developers have easier access to games and have 
easier entry into game development right there is actually going to make you more money in the long run right mm-hmm. uh just well and then the other thing users. the other thing too is that um i mean we'll talk about some of the the tools coming in the next version of unreal engine um but and ultimately there are going to be developers who still want to use unity for one main reason unreal engine requires c plus plus unity and a lot of other engines use things like c sharp and a lot of people dislike c plus plus yeah um and so this is going to get people that are just getting started in games if like you know if like let's say i wanted to make a game right now i uh-huh. don't have any i i've done a little bit of programming but i don't have any significant knowledge any significant attachment to any one language yeah. now if i go into this with c plus plus knowledge and I, I go to learn unreal engine so i go to learn c plus plus well let's say i make a game that goes bonkers and does amazingly well and epic likes me and wants to to buy my you know team or buy you know my ip or whatever it is and employ me well i already know c plus plus it makes acquisitions easier. It makes um, yeah. anyone joining any dev team that uses C++ easier. Um, if any studio wants to buy up an indie that made a game on Unreal and that studio uses Unreal, that's so much easier for them. That's a game changer, which is actually much bigger for Microsoft than Sony, which is funny because Unreal Engine 5 was demoed on the PS5. Um, but um, it's just bigger games don't I mean, there are a lot of big games that use Unity, but like first part, a lot of first party games and a lot of the bigger third party games don't use Unity. And no, so, no, absolutely not. No, it's getting not. indies. See... Go ahead. Uh, getting Sorry, indies delay. onto a, a C plus plus base engine, I think, is it's going to be you know something more difficult for indies, but they still have the choice of which route they want to go. But if they start with C plus plus then it's going to be easier for them to adapt and move into um, a lot of larger studios. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. And and so it's just out of the larger engines is a incentive for smaller people to start with them instead. And that makes sense. I mean, Unity is a lot of times still considered a small engine that's, that's <laughs> really for indie and stuff like that, not for the bigger developers. And just this right here is just incredible. Now, yeah. now, to make sure I understand, you might have said it earlier and I may have just missed it. The the engine is also free, correct? Correct. Okay, so the engine's free, no royalties, and you can post it on the Epic Store for free. And yes. And it's easier to do crossplay. And it's easier to do crossplay. Um, well, any engine, it's really easy because you just adopt the code. It's not actually yeah, easier right. in this okay, case. I guess it's not. Well, um, it may still be easier because it's probably already readily available for for it. You know what I mean? Yeah, but from my understanding, it's the way that they have set up the Epic Online services. Uh-huh. It's pretty much just you just like kind of put the code in almost. and that's it. Yeah. Um, it's designed to be extremely easy because um, they, they want indies to be able to do it is the big thing. Um, right, right. Most big companies could do it on their own. They don't need this. I mean, um, but the other thing, um, too, and back to the engine thing that I was discussing. Um, a lot of the bigger engines use C plus plus. Um, I know that like uh, CryEngine can use multiple languages, but C plus plus is the big one, I believe. Which also should line it, up with Lumberyard then, because Lumberyard's kind of based on on correct, CryEngine. Yeah. 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 So that um, right there, and, I mean, that's a huge thing there because you, you, those are some of the biggest graphics engines, right? So mm-hmm. you're already capturing a two huge segments of the of the larger market there. Yeah. So, um, I mean, personally, I just I love this move. Um, it's going to be interesting to see how Unity responds because while Unity has the advantage of the easier programming language, um, you have to pay fifteen hundred dollars for the professional edition license, mm. and their uh, royalties are um, starting at $100,000 rather than um, a million. So it already makes more logical sense to go this way anyway, then? Yes. Like, I feel like unless you know the languages for Unity already because you've either programmed in Unity or that's what you've learned for whatever reason, there isn't really a great reason to go with it over this now. So now, I mean, I'm hoping that this sparks some competition in the game engine world, though. That's what I would like to see, is I would mm-hmm. like to see game engines that are cheaper, that are free, that are, have lower royalties and stuff like that. Um, yeah. And, and that helps the gaming market as a whole, and uh, I would even like to see some open source, more open source game engines. But Yeah. And um, Epic clearly wants to get more people into game development too, and I think this is a big step to do that. If you can use the same engine that 
most or like a significant amount of Microsoft Studios are using and the same engine that is used for um, games like Gears, then yeah. like that that's already like exciting. If you can do that for free and if your game happens to sell well, you're not like going to be hurting for money. Um, right. But they make, if you have the Epic Store, they make the um, Unreal Engine like a, oh, I just should not have opened that because that darkened my screen. The, the dark um, engine. Yes. Um, they put Unreal Engine right below your friends list in the Epic Launcher. Like, they want people to see and click on and try it. Okay. Okay. Interesting. And they, uh, they have... I aware of that. Yeah, and they have, like, when you first open it, they have stuff to learn how to make things. They advertise the Epic Online services. They have a marketplace to get assets, and there's a lot of free stuff in there. Um, and I've mentioned to you, and we'll talk about this more with Unreal 5, but there's um, these things called Quixel Mega Scans, and you can get some stuff from their service for free if you're using Epic. And so they're doing all these things like, you know, okay, you might be able to learn programming, but you're not going to also necessarily want to be an artist. And if you can pretty cheaply buy an animation system from their marketplace and get assets for free, and you just have to do the programming, that makes it a hell of a lot easier to make a game. It removes you... a lot of the barriers of entry, I think. Yeah. And then at that point, it's just if you want to do it, all you have to sacrifice is time, mm -hmm. not money. Yeah. And that that is something that I feel like impacts. And I know it has me personally impacts creators as a whole, not just mm -hmm. game devs, but creators as a whole, is if you have to spend money in order to really get into it, then you run into this wall where you have to spend time to earn money so that you can spend time to do the thing <clears> that you're interested in in terms of creation. And like, that's a wall that I've hit is like buying camera equipment, streaming equipment, stuff like that. And I know that game developers run into the same thing, but I think sometimes even to a, uh, you know, to, to a larger extent. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, because, because it's, it's hard for one person to do the entire thing. And a lot of times game developers end up being a group of people and then the costs start to go up again. Uh, everybody yeah. has to have workstations capable of working on it and stuff. So uh, this uh, just removing as many barriers of entry as possible so that it is down to just having the ability to use the software and then your time is enough right there to benefit the entire gaming market. And so I'm glad that they're going this direction. I, I wanted to get your opinion and, well, I guess I'll, I'll let you finish first. Uh, it's Unreal Engine 5 related, so I'll wait till we're there. Oh, okay. Then, yeah, let me explain that then, because actually you set up a perfect transition to that. If we're talking about making things easier for developers, yeah. um, Unreal Engine 5 does that on so many levels. Um, so this was expected or originally planned to have been announced at the Game Developers Conference um, along with Sony's PlayStation 5 um, mm -hmm. event. And for those that didn't watch it, uh, it's probably fine that you didn't unless you like super technical discussions. Sony's PS5 event was very dry and super technical. It was, and it was, which I was not very yeah. hype building. I, I really enjoyed it because the specs were super interesting, especially since it's a unique console. It's not just PC hardware in a box necessarily. Yeah, um, which is essentially what Xbox is at this point. Yeah, Um. so I, I was already excited from that, but they were planning on doing that and then at the same time unreal was going to show their first demo running on a ps5 and this was going to be our first look at what next gen consoles can potentially do um and so they dropped this as part of the summer games fest um last week and they showed a nine minute demo of essentially like a tech demo that they had made just to show off the features it was you know the art style and everything is clearly designed to show off the geometry ability and things of the engine but let, let's talk more specifics so the first thing they announced was some new tech that they are calling nanite now in this they called it or they they said it was truly virtualized geometry and what they mean by that is currently when you're making a game you make your asset you make you know a really intricate 3d model you can't just put that model in the game and have it render. I mean, you can, but the game's going to run like shit. What you yeah. have to do if you want to import a really high quality asset, whether it's a ZBrush model, it's a photogrammetry scan, which is going to be really big for next gen games, um, or really any art asset at all, is you take the asset, especially if it's a 3D asset, um, and you have to see how it works in the engine and then optimize the asset. And then even once you get it optimized, you can't just run that optimized asset. You have to get normal maps if it's a bumpy asset to get the 
the shapes of it to actually show. You have to then also create LODs, which are level of detail files. So as you get closer to an asset, if you notice the pop in, and it's obviously sometimes less noticeable as you get closer, they don't pop in as much, um, but they're actually running or loading in different versions of that asset at different levels of detail, which is which why they're called LODs. Uh, uh, data usage and other stuff like that. Yeah. Um, like and that, so this already helps with, it's yeah. a ton of work for developers, for, for artists, like they spend, a, you know, probably half, if not more of their time, not just making the art, but actually making the art and then downgrading the art. Right. And right. that's a huge issue. And you can't just, and you know, if you want to make, let's say you're a developer who's thinking ahead and you are like, I want to make an asset that'll work now. But then if we decide to do a graphics upgrade for future PC hardware or for next-gen consoles, or we want to remaster the game. If you decide to take the time to make an even higher quality asset, that's kind of a waste of time for 10 years. You might as well just make the the one at the highest tier of what you could utilize now and then yeah. make the new one in five years because the, the higher detailed one is useless for those five years. Um, right. And so it, it really changes how things are made. And... You know, they talked in this about Quixel mega scans, which I didn't know what that was, so I looked it up. Quixel is like a specific place that makes art assets and scans things, hence the scan. Um, and they have like pre-optimized game assets. And if you go into Unreal Engine's free section on their marketplace, you can download game optimized Quixel mega scan assets. However, you still have to go in and make LODs for some of that stuff. Um, and so even if you get free assets online, it's still time consuming to to really make work well if you want to have like a, a high fidelity 3D game. And what they're doing with this is when they say truly virtualized geometry, um, for those that have done some photo editing or at least know what vector images are, um, it's like essentially just, you know, the outline of the image and you can adjust the size very easily. This is kind of that. You can take the asset, the engine handles every aspect of downscaling it to the further away distances. So as you approach it, you just get closer and it just changes how the triangles load. You know what would be interesting is this might actually give consumers a certain level of control as well as where you could have a slider for distance as we have in games currently, but instead of distance of this is how far out things render, it can be more dynamic than that. Whereas if you increase your render distance, things don't just render further away, but things that are further out render at a higher quality level than they would before, even if they were previously visible. That kind of stuff too. Yes and no. Um, so from, I mean, I, I don't know the specific, I'm not that knowledgeable on game engines. I have no experience what, with them. you haven't made a AAA game? Nor have I made a game engine. <laughs> um, <laughs> but from my understanding with the way that this works is that based on the hardware available, and I mean, yeah. obviously, if you change the settings, you might override this, but based on the hardware available, it just loads as much triangles as it can down to the pixel level, but it's not oh, going to, okay. it's not going to do more than the pixel level because that's pointless. Yeah. The, the whole goal is to get it so that ideally any triangle of any shape of any object on screen that matters the the triangle that matters most would be the one that's shown and as you get closer different triangles will matter but as long as you're rendering the same amount of triangles as you are pixels so that every single pixel is its own thing yeah you're getting as much detail as you can and adjusting that more isn't really going to help at longer distances because you can only display so much no, okay, okay, that's true. That's true. That so that's my understanding. Didn't. Maybe I'm completely yeah. wrong. If anyone happens to understand this stuff better, please feel free to leave a comment on the video and prove me wrong. Um, but I, from my understanding, it doesn't seem like it's something that would actually help get more detail than you can already essentially get from this because it's already doing as much as it can. Yeah. Um, and so that is going to be huge for game develop for especially for artists within the game development side of things. But even if you're just getting started in game development, if you can just download assets and throw them in, and you don't have to take the time to learn how to to alter them to make them work better and to make them optimized, then that's huge for for new people getting started. We're just we're seeing this pattern of of developer friendliness from, yeah. from Epic on a lot of different ends. And then also when you look at you know AAA games. Um, 
especially for AAA studios that want to be smaller, that aren't trying to go the route of um of like the Assassin's Creeds where you have ten studios working on a game. Yeah. Um, because for those that haven't seen, um, a couple of people that worked at Respawn have left and made their own studio, and they specifically said that one of the goals is to, um, in order to better be able to improve conditions for employees, they want to have less employees. Um, and so with that, they want to be able to try and make AAA quality titles with less staff. And yeah. this type of thing is going to go a long way for that. If you can have, you know, artists the entire time that they're spend spending at your, you know, at, at work, sorry, um, the entire time they're spending at work is spent making the new art instead of making art. And then I'm sure most artists don't like taking their art and just downgrading it half their time. Um, yeah, and so if yeah. they can just make art, it's probably going to be much more enjoyable of a job for them if they can spend their entire time doing that. And it means you need less people to get the same work done. Or in the case of um, indie AA size studios, that just means you can get more work done and make your game look better in the same amount of time. Because yeah, generally, yeah. art isn't what takes most of the time in the game development process. You make the art, and then while the developers are doing the rest of the development, you optimize that art and you yeah. probably spend most of your time up to the the launch day optimizing that art so that it can be as little of a performance impact as possible well now you can just make art up until it's time to finalize the game yeah and that right there i mean that that's that's a benefit for our artists but i mean going into the realm of of triple a again is that could even benefit triple a uh, development of not necessarily just being able to lower staff if that's what they want to do, but also uh, just I increase the the capacity of what they're trying to do, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, so if, if you can you spend more, more time, time, yeah, if you can spend yeah, more time yeah. on the art, you can make better art. Right, right. Either, either better art, which can lead to better graphics, better textures, that kind of stuff, or potentially, you know, a lot a lot of people are skilled in different different um, or in multiple areas for doing mm -hmm. game development, and so you could potentially have the artists where maybe they have some time to work on some other aspects of the game as well and mm -hmm. um you know side quests or what, whatever it may be right uh or just adding more art not just better art but more art more more things uh that that add more realistic detail to a game especially with the the cusp of vr where how many books you have on a shelf and how many pens you have over here and cards you have over here are actually starting to matter they're not mm -hmm. just there for tiny aesthetic things uh, yeah, being able to have more time to focus on that kind of stuff is also a big deal. Mm -hmm. And it can help and a then, lot for, um, you know, a lot, especially like artists might move into design, I feel like a lot more than some other things. And so yeah. like if, um, you know, if you're an artist and you finish six months before the game drops, well, if your AAA studio wants to release, you know, really uh, good, like actual substantive add-on content for free, quickly after launch uh -huh. if you can have them take time that they already would have normally spent optimizing assets and now just work on that art it's cheaper for the studio to put out free content later and down the line yeah that's a good point too yeah yeah it's it's just lowering costs which should in theory be beneficial all around but until we break the every game is 60 dollars mark that is a little bit harder there in terms of the pricing to a consumer, but well, yeah. Um, and I, one thing I will also say though is like, um, you know, you and I have both discussed on the show how we think games should be more expensive. They, you know, they are so expensive to make, um, and it, yeah, yeah, it, they they have gotten some, way more expensive. Cheaper. Yeah, for sure. Um, but like game, game big AAA games have gotten more expensive to make. That's just a fact. They have. Anyone can they have. can disagree with that, but they have generally with new consoles that jump significantly because to take advantage of that hardware you need more artists you need more developers you need more engine work um all of that yeah, yeah. well this not just helps reduce the fact that next gen would require more detailed art and so therefore would increase cost on the artist end this cuts so many levels that it might help lower the need for potential game price increases in the future yeah, yeah, and you know that's actually that's actually something I want to touch on is I I, I get kind of um, riled up a little bit about the sentiment that 
that DLC, like you, you see these memes, right? About uh, gamers are frustrated because you bought the game, but it's just the hamburger bun or just the bun and not all the ingredients in between until you get the DLC and people complaining about that. But you know, the reason that that's been happening for AAA, I mean, there's certainly some of it, you look at some of the stuff that EA has done that's just predatory practice, but you look at other aspects of it and- EA has a, gotten a better. Of, yeah, yeah, just I know, but that. just as an example, uh, but- yeah. but the reasoning for that is because if they just released the damn game and it was a hundred and twenty dollars you're not gonna buy it you're gonna mm -hmm. you're gonna there's gonna be protests and outrage because the game's too expensive because there's this understanding that for some reason over the last 20 years games haven't got more expensive to create and that's where it just that that really nicks me personally is i'm like you've got to be kidding me like like mario kart double dash was sixty dollars and somehow these games that are just drastically bigger and have a huge team behind them. They're only supposed to cost $60. So then the company and it was tries a, to... And the Switch version was a remake. And then, Yes, yes, yes. And so, and then, like, I just feel like, you know, if, if you expect them to not do the DLC, either do it as free DLC or do it as, a, a, you know, like, just already included into the game, then you need to be okay with paying more. The reason that a lot of companies are doing it is because you're not paying as much for a game, not because uh, they they want to treat you like you're supposed to continue to pay them money. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then the next big tech that they announced, which will also significantly help developers, is Lumen. And what this is, is a multi-bounce global illumination system. Um, now, most of the time, if you've paid attention to any, like, um, you know, ray tracing or anything like that. If you've heard global illumination, you've probably heard it in parallel with hardware-based ray tracing. And what's really yeah. interesting about what they're doing here is that it, in effect, is still ray tracing. Like, the idea is that it's tracing rays. So it's ray tracing. Yeah. Um, but they're doing it in a software way that is more efficient and therefore doesn't actually utilize the uh, RT cores and next gen consoles are going to have RT cores as well as, you know, the Ryzen or not Ryzen, um, the RTX cards and presumably RDNA 2 since next gen consoles are RDNA 2. Yeah, we, um, we hope that we get that from AMD on PC and not just console or I'd be very disappointed. Yeah. Um, and so what we're looking at here is we're looking at um, a software way to do the global illumination aspect of lighting, which for those that don't know, um, what that means necessarily. Simplest way to put it would be um, in real life, if you light up something, it doesn't just shine the light on just that one spot. It lights up the area around it. And um, in games, that's not how lighting normally works unless you use some kind of global illumination system. And the more bounces you get, the better that looks. And so if you have a light source at the end of a cave and you'll probably show at least pictures if not clips from the unreal so it'll make more sense oh, i will yeah, yeah um but you know you have the light source coming from the sky um and then you see how the light um in the cave there's some light there's no light sources in that in that tunnel but you can still see some light in there that's because light bounces through there like it would normally or right. naturally yeah, um yeah. and so that's the point of something like global illumination is to get a more accurate um more accurate lighting in in general, but it's also much easier to do. Um, you can generally make any game look like ray tracing lighting wise, if you do enough work, but it's a ton of work. You can get yeah. reflections through screen space reflections, but you can also get reflections by baking them in. Most lighting is baked in manually in games. And so when you look at especially early RT demos where it wasn't really impressive, implementations yeah. of ray tracing um compared to games people were like they look the same like it doesn't look any better why does this matter well it matters because if you can especially with something like this where it's going to be more optimized for hardware than like um you know developers having to initially put in ray tracing on rt hardware which was very difficult because nobody had done it before yeah um if you can just check a box and as good of global illumination can run as you know you can get on consoles Oh my god, that's a game changer for game developers. Now, just to be clear, this is still a form of rasterization, correct? Yes. As far as we know? Okay, okay. Yes. Yeah, okay, so so this right here I think is a big deal. Um, So I think there's a couple things to take away from here. Is obviously, I mean, the better lighting and whatnot, but but I think in, in relevance to 
and I know you kind of want to talk about this one too, in RT hardware, uh, ray tracing hardware in specific, is this is freeing up ray tracing hardware, as you mentioned. And I think that that, while we expect a massive increase in terms of the ray tracing hardware capabilities of uh, the 3000 series from NVIDIA, and like you said, hopefully RDNA 2 GPUs, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think this might actually help people running 2000 series GPUs that have RT cores uh, have some level of benefit where you can get the advantage without necessarily having the frame drops that we see where like a 2060 for ray tracing is essentially useless. I have one. I know it's mm -hmm. essentially useless for ray tracing. And even the 2080 Max-Q in the laptop here is like it can do ray tracing, but it's still not the sweet 60 that I want on most games, right? And so a 2080 Ti is pretty close to capable of that. But um, it, I, I think you may be able to see games where they have some of the amazing lighting effects. And then you also have ray tracing to both supplement the lighting and supplement reflections in particular uh, that make it so a game can run at a higher frame rate on some of these older ray tracing hardwares. And um, maybe that's what NVIDIA was counting on in some ways too, although it looks like, you know, the 3000 series is coming out. But uh, um, yeah, I, I mean, from my understanding, there is still going to be, I mean, not for my, there is definitely going to be advantages to um, ray trace global illumination. Um, oh, if you watch sure, this yeah, trailer, yeah. if you watch this trailer, one of the big things is that um, the way that they're doing this is not actually as instantaneous as they make it sound. Um, you can tell even just watching it at full speed, but if you watch it frame by frame, it takes a couple frames for the lighting to actually update. So when the light source moves, um, the global illumination aspect of it doesn't actually recalculate right away. It takes however many milliseconds ends that. up being a frame or two. Yeah, um, yeah no, I, I totally noticed that. I guess, I guess what, I, what I mean, though, is, is like... Obviously, ray tracing is still going to have its benefit, but if it's easy enough yeah. to implement, as you mentioned, then you could potentially have the option where higher-end ray tracing GPUs do more ray tracing GI, but ones that can't do this instead. Yes. And if it's and easy enough to implement, you just have both, and it switches depending on your hardware. Yeah. And then also, you could have a situation where game developers can use that hardware for other things. Global Illumination doesn't really do reflections um, right. fully. And so if you have ray traced reflections and then you have um gi for the world that could be really good and i'd argue that if you're doing um like a competitive multiplayer game with ray with um really advanced real-time lighting you should do ray traced reflections because presumably if you're doing this you're gonna have some situations you might have if, if reflections really matter at all then they could affect the game and so you yeah. want that to be frame accurate. You don't want that to be two, three frames later, because if you're utilizing something where you might check a reflection to check an area before you move in, then having that be accurate instantly is important. Yeah, um, and no, so definitely, freeing definitely. up the ray tracing hardware to do that while still getting the global illumination lighting quality would be awesome. Yeah, no, and I, so I, I, I love this. I think it's amazing. And so th this actually leads me to what, what I wanted to ask about Unreal Engine 5 is, in your personal uh, opinion and experience, do you think this is potentially surpassing in some ways what engines like CryEngine, uh, and obviously we don't know what the new Crisis is like quite yet, but in terms of graphics capabilities, not in terms of ease of use or features. With where CryEngine is graphics. now, with where CryEngine is now, yes, 100%. Um, and, with where CryEngine will likely go via its next announcement which i'm guessing will it become with the crisis launch yeah no Pro well we've already seen like some of the capabilities of cryengine's ray tracing and stuff you know with the demo yeah right we've, so, we've seen the ray tracing yeah. but i'm just saying like um the the geometry stuff i feel like every engine is going to have to implement some form of it because oh, yeah. um you know we've already seen if you've seen the um teaser from bethesda about um uh, Elder Scrolls 6 and about um, Starfield, they've mentioned in when they've talked about those games, what little they've talked about, they've mentioned photogrammetry. Photogrammetry is honestly, from what I've heard from developers, like I've watched developers talk about the Unreal Engine 5 stuff, they've said that photogrammetry is oftentimes useless unless you have a massive team right now. Because mm. what photogrammetry is, is really detailed scans of an object. And Getting a really detailed, really high-end scan of an object, if you then have to go in and optimize and cut down the object and then spend a bunch of time making LODs, is useless because you lose all of the quality 
of photogrammetry. And that starts you could just more make the asset too. at that point. Yeah, 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 and then and then it gets even more expensive because you've got the scanners, you've got the people to scan, you've got the time put in place for the LOD, mm -hmm. and you still have to essentially remake the asset as a whole anyway because you're cutting yeah. out so much detail. And so any engine that's going to really be able to utilize photogrammetry is probably going to have to do something like this. Yeah. Um, and so I, I, my guess, if anyone's going to do it, uh, you know, also have it ready about the same time as Epic, it's probably going to be. Crytek and CryEngine. Hopefully, they, yeah. I they, hope they, of, their budget constraints haven't made it a problem. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, they're, you know, how much money are they getting from Amazon for Lumberyard? You know, I, I'm not sure. I don't know the back-end details behind that. Yeah. You know, I know but Lumber I'm just Lumber, saying, like, Lumber, Lumber presumably Lumber. they're getting something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I know. I would assume they're getting or got something, and, uh, you know, I don't know what the payout was like for, for that tech, but I'm hoping that they yeah. were able to really do a good job, which, I mean, it looks like, you know, the remaster is going to be beautiful, but, um, you know, we'll we'll wait until it actually comes out. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so, like, I, I, I would be surprised if CryEngine didn't have that. Um, it's probably something that, you know, I mean, there's no way they didn't see photogrammetry coming. So yeah. they'd have to have started working on it at some point. What about like Frostbite um, and other, other engines like that? Do you feel like there's any comparison at all? In terms of graphic fidelity, again, not in terms of development. I mean, TV. again, not now. This is this is a huge step. What we are seeing in this demo is a huge step up from anything we've seen in any other engine. Yeah, okay. Um, I, mean, I, I yeah, do I think the that... the first to announce it, not necessarily the first to do it, right? I, I get you. Oh, yeah, for sure. I You know, Starfield is potentially a couple years away, but whatever engine it's using has this like I, there's no way that they've talked about photogrammetry as much as they have and they don't have this it's, it's um, gonna know this it's type just, of it's thing. gonna be i mean it's bethesda it's gonna be a reiteration of an engine that's 12 years old uh, so let's let's be real here i mean and then, and i would are gonna add de nouveau anti-cheat to it yes <laughs> probably <laughs> um but like I, I i think that this is just the way that game engines will go and different implementations will be more so what matters because Ultimately, if there's an engine in development that doesn't have this, that is designed to be utilized by anyone else, yeah. um, rather than just a specific in-house studio that can make the decisions about whether or not they want to take the time to create LODs and other things, um, every engine developer who wasn't working on this, if there was any, was is probably shitting bricks. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's... It's because like yeah <laughs> yeah like like um you know people ask why um ea shot themselves in the foot and forced um um what's it called again um frostbite uh forced yeah, frostbite. frostbite across their entire platform or a uh, set of studios ultimately the reason that publishers will often do stuff like that and um uh ubisoft snowdrop engine for example is because when you look at how ea and Ubisoft and Activision work, they aren't necessarily, while they are a bunch of separate studios, they don't really work like that. They work yeah. like a bunch of teams within one larger studio oftentimes where they'll make, you know, you might be working on Assassin's Creed for six months and then, okay, you're done with your portion, now move on to Division. And yeah. so having familiarity among the engines matters a lot. But that being said, if Unreal Engine 5 comes out and whoever was making the next version of Snowdrop or the next version of Frostbite wasn't working on this, EA or Ubisoft is going to be asking them why they weren't. Because this is a yeah. huge difference for art teams. And it's just it's such a, a big deal that I feel like every engine's going to eventually adopt it. I, or die. <laughs> yeah. Kind of, kind of adopt or die kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, the in-house engines are all just going to adopt it, I feel like. Yeah, um, yeah. And I don't think that the third-party ones... I mean, like, if Unity doesn't have it, it's nowhere near as big of a deal because Unity is not made by big AAA games, oh, sure. big yeah, game studios, yeah. are used by them. Um, and so, like, for, for the big engines, though, they all have to do it. They Definitely. just have to. Yeah. yeah. Um, so this game... That's coming out. I want you to be the one that talks about this as well because I don't know a ton about it. It just I've just seen the demo. Yes. So Ghosts of Tsushima. Uh, this is an interesting one. This was actually announced back in I think it was 2017 or 2018. Uh, Sony hasn't actually announced any new games in years. Um, 
it's kind of wild. They've been yeah, holding their yeah. games for, for PS5. Um, yeah. But they announced Ghost of Tsushima and then went silent on it. They showed a couple trailers and that was about it. Um, and at the time, there was no real samurai games out. Um, Sekiro was coming soon, but th- this was announced the same, I believe the same E3 or same like game announcement window as Sekiro. Um, and so this has is a samurai game. out yet? Sekiro? Yeah, Sekiro has been out for a bit. Okay. Um, and um, so this is a samurai game. However, um, based on the gameplay demo we got this week or last week, I guess, um, it looks a lot like a combination of the feudal era Assassin's Creed that a lot of people have been asking for, as well as Breath of the Wild, um, which very much excites me because I have both yeah. loved Breath of the Wild and really wanted feudal era Assassin's Creed. Um, uh-huh. So all around yeah. a win for me. Um, now, is, it, is this PlayStation exclusive? It is, right? Yes, it is made yeah. by Sucker Punch, who made Infamous. Okay. Um, yeah, and right. it is, um, you know, they are completely owned by Sony. Yeah. Um, okay. And so this game, um, for one, it looks beautiful for being on a PS4 Pro. I do want to see what the yeah. PS4 version looks like. I'm very curious as to how much worse that's going to look, because obviously it's going to look a lot worse, but. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, I when I saw it on PS4 Pro, like it, it, it didn't take long, but it took me a second to realize this is not a PS5 demo. <laughs> it was yeah. very, very. Uh, I was, I was impressed. You know, I started and to I, see. Okay, I can see the limits of view distance really heavily and things like yeah, that. Yeah, I also can't wait to see what a PS5 optimized version of this game is gonna look like. Which did they confirm is happening? No, they did not. They are not okay. saying anything. Sony officially has not said or shown anything about PlayStation Five, like software at all unreal has shown us way more than sony uh, completely well a lot of it comes down to the fact that sony's plans were destroyed with covid they from from what we know the plan was gdc to show developers this for the first hands-on real-time demo of anything on playstation 5 to be at gdc and for the first hands-on with the controller to likely have been at gdc like yeah. GDC was supposed to be the start of it, which is normal for Sony. They showed off PlayStation VR at GDC. I believe they showed off PS4 at GDC initially in the same way. Um, and so what they have likely for years had as plans got thrown out the window. Which is just rough. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so now what we're expecting is um, June, very early June, potentially the 2nd or the 4th to be when they do their initial announcement of um, games and stuff. Okay. Um, but I even then I don't think that they're actually they might say Ghost of Tsushima is getting an upgrade, but what they don't want is they don't want people to wait to buy Ghost of Tsushima until they get a PS5. Yeah. And yeah, so I don't think they're gonna show that. that for Ghost of Tsushima. I also don't think they're gonna show us Last of Us 2 on PlayStation 5 until yeah. after those games have launched. I think um, probably right. Yeah. That yeah, makes the so, most logical sense. Yeah, back to Ghost of Tsushima real quick. Um like gameplay that they showed. Um, what's really interesting is that the HUD is very minimal. Um, really, you'll have whatever objective you have selected. The text of the objective will be up top, but it won't show you where to go. If you want to know where to go, you either open up the big map or you literally call upon the wind to show you where to go. And it will like blow a gust of wind in the direction that you need to head. And it's really cool yeah. because, like, for me, I really loved just going into Breath of the Wild and looking around and deciding where to go and exploring. Yeah, no, it, it, those big open world games have to be have to be done in a way where you get a sense of exploration. If you're just told <laughs> where to go, it might as well be linear anyway. Yeah. So I, I, I like the direction they're going with this as a kind of more immersive experience um, versus a, a technical experience, which yeah. makes sense for something that's supposed to take place long ago, you know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> And then um, in addition to wind guiding you, um, there's some more obvious stuff like smokestacks that you'll decide to go to to find a fire where somebody's sitting at and talk to them or help them. Um, Stuff like that. But then even then, the animals in the game will guide you to certain things. So you might be going down a trail and a bird flies by and starts like kind of going near you and you realize, oh, this bird isn't just an effect. It's actually guiding me to something. It's guiding me to a point of interest within the game. Um, foxes within the game will show you where shrines are, and those shrines are how you get upgrades. Kind of like Breath of the Wild, but it's not like you go in it and do a puzzle. 
It's just you go to the shrine and you get the the upgrade. Right. Um, but you kind of get guided by the wind, the birds, the foxes, whatever other animals they might have in the game. And it's like this world kind of guides you around. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I appreciate what they're doing with it. And so I'm I'm very excited about the exploration aspect. Um, the combat aspect is also very interesting. Um, it's very Assassin's Creed like, especially if you go in as how they call it the ghost, which is um, essentially a ninja. Um, in feudal era Japan, that's seen as a dishonorable thing. You know, samurais fight people, sure, and they kill people, sure, but that was like there was an honorable way to do that. You'd have these showdowns. Mm -hmm. And um, if you play as the samurai um, side, you can do that. You can like walk up to an area where you're supposed to be infiltrating and you can, first guy you see, have a showdown with them, fight them. Other people might come up after you've killed him, but you've done your like honorable fight to start this off. Yeah. Um, whereas if you go in as the ghost, that is seen as dishonorable. We don't know yet how much that's going to matter in the game. Um, right. It's possible that it doesn't matter at all. But, you know, from my, if I remember correctly with Infamous Second Son, you had quite a bit of leeway as far as morality goes, and you could do things yeah. that were good or do things that were bad, and that yeah, would affect the, the game. Even the OG Infamous was really was famous for that. <laughs> yeah. And so, like, it would make a lot of sense for the same developer to implement something like that in the game. Yeah. And they yeah, talked totally. about how enemies will grow to fear you if you play as the ghost. And one of the things that we saw that was really interesting was so there's been other games that have. You know, they've had like audio cues that somebody was scared or they would just turn around and run away. But there was yeah. actually a guy like on his back, like crawling away, trying to just get away from you because he was so terrified he didn't want to get up. Yeah. And like yeah, that's wild that was, to have like to have like an actual game mechanic around that. Well, it um, helps with the uh, uh, realism and, and immersiveness, which is what they've been focusing on with this. It yeah. helps it feel like you're really taking a part in this where people are reacting to you. Mm -hmm very directly and very emotionally and physically not just uh not just dialogue <laughs> yeah um and then for the samurai side i want to know how um the controls are going to work because yeah. one of the things that people are concerned about after having seen that is there's a lot of one hit kills which makes sense samurais were precise they knew how to kill people if you weren't fighting another like well-trained person and you're very skilled with a sword you probably could get a one hit kill yeah, yeah. And so we want to know how that works. Like, there was some enemies that had armor, and so obviously you'd have to break through that. There was some enemies that had um, the ability to defend. Is it just that some enemies are one-hit kills and some aren't? Or is it that you have to, you know, they, they talked about how certain stances would matter for fighting enemies, and so maybe you have to be in the right stance to get one-hit kills against enemies, and you might have a variety of enemies that only some are in one stance and some are in another. Right. Who knows how that's going to work? I just want to see more on that to really be able to tell. But it looks interesting. I'm very excited. I will definitely try both. I'm definitely going to pick up this game. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it looks very interesting. You know, if I had the time and had a PlayStation, I'd probably buy it too. <laughs> yeah. Um. So, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater One Plus Two remake. So I wanted to, before we talk about some of the interesting stuff around that, I did want to throw out that there was some newer news today which I don't think I see mentioned in here, that it looks like it's going to uh, be adding in a good amount of microtransactions, <laughs> which oh, is for something that's a remaster. Is it, is it like just cosmetics or? I did not read into it in detail. I read like an intro paragraph. So it was uh -huh. something I wanted to bring up while we were talking about it. Um, you know, uh, hopefully it's just cosmetics. Hopefully, uh, are you looking it up? Is that what you're doing? Yeah, I'm trying to, yeah. Okay, hopefully it's just cosmetics. If it's not, then that's frustrating for a game. I don't know what they would be made. Yeah, I don't know what they would do that wouldn't be just cosmetics. And, like, honestly, if they yeah. end up having, like, extra costumes, I don't really care. Yeah, right. Um, no, it wasn't, especially since it wasn't the type of thing where in the game, originally, you unlocked the stuff. If they were to, like, have it so you previously unlocked visuals and then, or, like, unlocked cosmetics and then they decided to move that to microtransactions. Yeah. That would be really bad. New, new, yeah. yeah. Um. Let's see. Speaking on the matter, according to GameSpot, let's see who is. One sec. Head of Vicarious Visions. Um, we're not planning on having monetization at launch, because um, they want people to get the full package. They didn't even. So 
they didn't clarify no microtransactions, but they didn't actually say that microtransactions might come. They said additional content. Oh, okay. And and they said buying stuff with real money. Now, there's a lot of ways that could work. It could come in the form of additional skaters, for example, which quite frankly would make sense. They'd have to pay to get the skater in the game. And so yeah, if they wanted yeah, to add true. other people that weren't originally in it, makes sense. Um, there has also been a lot of talk of potential for them to... Um, eventually, they'll probably do Pro Skater 3 and 4, or at least 3. Um, and so whether they do that as its own thing, or maybe they do it as DLC to this, that would still be monetization. Yeah, so no, that's true. Um, we'll see how they end up doing it, but... Who's they the haven't given specifics. Activision. Okay. Okay. Activision so that has does the worry me a little tricks. bit, but yeah. 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 Not, um, not we'll happy see, with but, but it seems like Vicarious Vision, and but to be fair, of the things Activision has done right recently, it's been uh-huh. the remakes. That's true. I think they did That's some mon- some microtransactions in um, Crash Team Racing. But I believe yeah. that was the only thing that they've done anything that people even had complaints about as far as the remakes go. Well, and if I'm being honest, Modern Warfare is actually quite well done too. Yeah. They did a pretty good job with that. There's not too much pay stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, so as long as they don't do a bait and switch later, it's uh, pretty pretty well done. So yeah. maybe they're um, trying to make improvements because of the negative sentiment around them. Yeah. Um, and so some other details about Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 1 and 2. Um, so the remake is coming September 4th. Um, it's launching on PlayStation 4, Xbox One, and it will be on PC, not via Blizzard's launcher, which you'd think it would yeah. be since it's an Activision game. It's an Epic Game Store exclusive. I was <laughs> semi-surprised, but not too surprised. Yeah, that's so. a weirder one for me because they yeah. have the option of taking... Yes, they're getting a payout, but generally the Epic Game Store payouts aren't a bunch of extra money. It's Mm-hmm. upfront right right money. right yeah and so like they'd make more money with it being on the battle net launcher unless they're planning on moving away from that i mean it wouldn't surprise me some of the moves the this company makes you know maybe and they're gonna move out of it which there's too many the other damn launchers. Two, I mean, maybe they're just planning on having the battle net launcher be for their competitive games that could be it too yeah we'll see we'll see that might be the direction they go which also makes sense, Battle.net, you know? <laughs> yeah, Battle. well, and then, so, and then yeah. like, the people that play competitive games heavily often, yeah. I mean, th- yes, they, you know, I'm not going to, like, generalize it too much, but, like, a lot of people that play competitive games heavily primarily play competitive games. Yeah. Whereas a lot of people true. that play, you know, like, sure, some of them might then go to Tony Hawk, but people that are really interested in Tony Hawk, really, ex- like, planning on dumping a bunch of hours into that, and were really big on um, you know, like the Crash Team Racing or Crash Bandicoot, um, Insane Trilogy and stuff like that. The people that generally dump a lot of time into those games don't have the time to dump into competitive games most of the time. You have yeah. only so much yeah. time for games, and so you generally pick story or casual games or, you know, sports games or whatever, or competitive shooters. Right. Um, right. And so maybe they're just trying to segment that off and, and take advantage of the wider marketplace. Um, because I mean, I imagine it's only timed exclusive to the Epic Store, so it'll probably come to That's Steam. That's usually and... how it goes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the developers of this are Vicarious Visions, which, for those that don't know, on top of the fact that they did the Crash Bandicoot Insane trilogy, which was pretty well done, um, they've also worked on Tony Hawk Pro Skater games, both for console, and they did pretty much all of the handheld Tony Hawk Pro Skater games in the past. Um, and so. That actually confused me because this game is not coming to Switch as of now. Yeah, yeah. Maybe and it yet will, the, maybe. Yeah. My guess it's is they just wanted though. to make sure and do the the 4K graphics, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, remaster. Yeah, do the upgraded graphics right and then figure out getting it on Switch and downscaling it later. Yeah, yeah. Which is, I mean, it might even, it, who knows, it might not even be later. It might be like very slightly later, you know? I feel like if it was going to be relatively close to launch, they would have announced it. Maybe. Yeah, I don't know. Um, My guess is that they probably have another studio working on the port. Porting it. Yeah, that could be too. And that they are waiting to put significant work... They were waiting to put significant work into it until 
this game was like feature complete uh-huh. because they don't want to fuck with the the skate code. They they are that's another big thing. They are not actually redoing the code for the skating. They are taking the handling code from the original games, which is something that a lot of people are going to appreciate. <laughs> yes, because they um they technically have already remade these games. Uh, there's a Tony Hawk Pro Skater HD which has some levels from each of these games and completely different handling code. And a lot of people yeah. didn't like it because of that. I still think it was good. It was fun. I, I own it. I've played it a lot, but it just, it didn't feel like the OG pro skater games. Right, right, right. And that's, that, that's something that's important for long-term fans to do. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's cool. Yeah, I do. Um, I hope it turns out good. So this is um uh, a little bit of a, of a quicker one here, this next topic, but, um, uh, I don't know if you've ever played it, Daniel. But uh, I tried Planet Side Two. I tried Planet Side Two with a friend a while, like a long time ago. Okay, played okay. it for I think a, a week or two, and then we dropped it. Okay, okay. So I I've put like probably fifteen hours into it. Nothing super mm -hmm. significant, but I played it a long time ago. Planet Side Two is a game that's been around for like eight years, and uh, it was really popular because it is a it's a massive multiplayer online shooter. It is not a story driven shooter. It is like a war based shooter where you fight other groups of enormous amounts of people. And I'll get into the numbers of how enormous these games really can get. Uh, but the developers kind of left Planet Side Two for a little while, trying to do Planet Side Arena. And the idea was they they were trying to kind of take the concept of how big of a game they made there and make a battle royale um, sort of style game. Um, they wanted something, their, their, their goal was something that could get a close to as big number of people into a setting for a fight faster than what current Planet Side 2 is, because battles in Planet Side 2, there's a long lull, you know, before you actually start to do a, a battle. Um, so anyway, that ended up being a kind of failure. So they have moved back to Planet Side 2, and they have, uh, at least verbally, there's no real like terms of service commitment here or anything, but they've kind of verbally committed to seven to eight years of development, which is doubling what there mm. currently is, where they're just over seven years right now. Uh, and they released a big update actually to Planet Side as well that uh, made a big, uh, I can't remember the name, it's Planet Side to Escalation that added a lot of content to the game. Now, they also potentially might try and do things like DirectX 12 implementation. They recently switched it over to DirectX 11. You know, again, this is an older game, so it was, was running on DX9. Mm -hmm. And uh, the first thing I'll say about that is I do hope that they do something about the graphics. The, the, the game runs really smoothly, and the graphics aren't, like, awful, but they're definitely old. And honestly, just taking their textures and bumping the resolution up without bumping up polygon count, without bumping up uh, a lighting detail or anything else, that would help a lot. Because when you look at a wall and the wall's blurry, you know, it's like, okay, come on, let's let's get a little more modern here. So I would like to yeah. see some work done, at least on the texture front, if they don't do any other graphics work. Um, but all in all, I would like a graphics revamp. But I'm just really excited for this game to be coming back, and I'm going to start playing it again. You know, I assumed it was going to die soon, <laughs> mm -hmm. but uh, it definitely has not. And um, PS4, in theory, should be getting the big Escalation update at some point. They're working on that port. And then PS5, uh, they're saying might get the game, but there's no official word on, on that or other consoles getting the game. Uh, but the big thing I want to say is to really get an understanding of how massive the game is. And so they actually broke the world record fairly recently. I think it was, um, I think it was this year. Uh, they broke the Guinness World Record for the largest online game at the same, uh, like simultaneous players online. Uh, mm. They had uh, 1,283 people, um, which again, this is like like on the planet, all in the same like vicinity. Uh, not like obviously, WoW has more than 1,200 players playing probably at this moment. <laughs> yeah, but uh, the the intention of being like imagine doing like a 1200 player raid right mm. that kind of thing and so that that's what's been really impressive here and what makes planet side fun is it really does feel like you are actually in a war it's kind of similar to mag which was massive action game for uh ps3 which was 200 an fps I game played for that game yeah 512 yeah yeah that was fun so imagine that except you add ships and bigger vehicles and then you yet double the player count again Mm -hmm. uh and it would be it, I, I think it's really cool and i'm planning to start like kind of diving into it again so nice yeah um yeah um, for me planet side 2 just never clicked when i had tried it before there's um, that's something they've worked on actually is there's a lot of uh the introduction to the game is really rough 
<laughs> it's hard to learn it. So they've they've done a lot to try and help with that and try and get you into what's called an outfit, which is like a clan. Because, mm-hmm. um, yeah, it's been... That was why I've only played for like 14 hours. I still didn't really understand the game that well. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, anything else you wanted to add about Planet Side 2? Not really. Well, let's uh, let's jump into Doom Eternal and how I'm not playing it anymore, despite it being one of my favorite games of all time. Yeah, so, they fucked up. Oh, man, they fucked up. And I mean, I pretty much entirely blame Bethesda for this because not only is it something that it sounds like they would do, and it's something that I don't think id Software would ever have the intention of doing, but mm-hmm. also the publisher is usually responsible for adding the anti-cheat features. So, Denuvo Anti-Cheat, which you may know the name Denuvo for their uh, an- or their DR download rights management stuff that's been really, really hardcore, but Denuvo also has anti-cheat software. And this was recently installed into Doom Eternal. Now, the first thing I will say is there was a cheating problem in battle mode on Doom Eternal. However, most people that buy Doom, e- Doom games are not at all buying for the purpose of playing online. In fact, I would say it's an extremely low portion of the player base. I don't have data to back that up, but I would actually be willing to bet my money that almost nobody plays battle mode in terms of like, like you're probably, it's probably gonna be one of those games like when people play Crisis 3 online where you end up playing with the same person for like a month in a row because there's not that many people that are really playing it consistently. Mm-hmm. Um, so anyway, they added it though because there was a, a some point of a cheat problem, which I understand them wanting to fix that. But on a single player game, adding what is essentially the hardest core uh, anti-cheat system out there is ridiculous. And this yeah. also has kernel level access to your system it is it is a security vulnerability in and of itself uh even though it does comply denuvo's products comply with gdpr so they're not directly collecting the data from you that they do have access to because they can access everything on your computer um Mm -hmm. but they even though they're not collecting that because they have to be gdpr compliant and believe it or not it's i don't think it's too hard to really track what they're looking at um so people could very easily figure that out prove against it and sue them and win uh, so I really do think they're following GDPR practices. But if there's ever an issue, if somebody ever figures out how to crack Denuvo's code, then we're in a real bad situation. But mm-hmm. that's not really the crux of the issue for me personally. The issue that I have is that this has effectively been a bait and switch on the minimum specs of the game. And that yeah. right there is not just anti-consumer, but is almost like I would say available for like some kind of lawsuit. Um and, you know, I, I kind of hope Bethesda does have some kind of lawsuit that happens because of this. Uh, yeah. So there is such a big performance impact from Denuvo Anti-Cheat, and it's up to 30% measured performance impact that there are people that legitimately can't play the game anymore. And that right there is an enormous problem. It's people that met the minimum specs and still do, as far as I'm aware, the minimum specs have not been bumped up from this. Uh, are no longer getting acceptable frame rates, you know, or people that are close to that minimum spec range were like, okay, I can play 1080p at like the almost lowest settings at 60 frames per second, which for a shooter, you do need that that smooth 60 FPS, please, uh, especially a really high, fast-paced competitive shooter. Mm-hmm. Um, having your frame rate be dropped down to, you know, 40 is a big, big, big deal. And I have talked to some people on Reddit that have seen an even seemingly bigger impact from this than they have from uh, other games running Denuvo Anti-Cheat where they're, like, seriously losing, like, 40 FPS. Mm-hmm. And so it's it's making the game completely unplayable for some people. Like, people are trying to refund it and stuff because they can no longer use it. And wow. that right there is just such a big impact to me. I'm a huge Doom fan. I've been playing Doom for, for quite a while. I got back... I got into it when i found a good sale on doom uh bfg uh i think it was the bfg uh i think that was the term now I'm brain farting but okay I, I gotta look that up really quick it was <laughs> doom bfg right yeah yeah no yeah doom 3 bfg edition on steam yeah so i found that a really long time ago when i first built my first gaming pc and fell in love with doom kind of immediately and it's been a great franchise of mine for a long time and i i bought all the old ones i'm planning to play through all those too uh just to get a sense of the lore and stuff it's really fun but this is a big disappointment to me and a lot of other doom fans because the id software has always done such a great job with optimization and the, the tech behind it which is one of my personal favorite aspects of games and uh id tech 7 the engine that doom eternal is running on is no exception it has been an incredible good incredibly good engine um digi- places like digital foundry and stuff have been really impressed with it uh you know it's stable up to the thousand frames per second mark it's really 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 pretty you know there's pretty much no complaints about it other than 
and this might not even be specific to the engine, but it would have been nice if they could have had even lower minimum specs because some systems still do struggle that have fairly powerful GPUs. But mm -hmm. this is just like an impact to a lot of people that have been a fan, fans for a long time. You know, I mean, I, I own the book um, Masters of Doom about this. And so it's just like, it's almost a little emotional for me to see this kind of stuff happening with a game that I love so much and seeing the publisher Bethesda, which I've always been nervous about damaging things like Doom. And they didn't really do it to 2016 very much. But uh, they really, really wrecked Doom Eternal here, and adding it after the fact is an even bigger problem. If we yeah. knew it was in there ahead of time, that'd be one thing. You could choose not to buy it. They could have different minimum specs and stuff like that. Still wouldn't like it. Still would have bought it. But this is to the point where, like, I don't even know if I want to play it until somebody figures out how to crack it so that I can get rid of that crap. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's very fucked. It's, that's just yeah. That's that's there's not a better word for it. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's just bad and sad, and the entire Doom community is just so angry about it, and I think rightfully so. I think it just makes sense to to just give it all you got and yell at Bethesda about this, because this is a real problem. Yeah. We'll see okay. if they change it, though. Bethesda's been uh, kind of hit or miss recently. And by hit They've or miss, I mean mostly miss. Mostly miss, yeah. Yeah, I mean, Fallout 76, come on. <laughs> That never turned and even, out to be a good game. Even the, even the new DLC was pretty poorly rated. Exactly, yeah. Like, the game never ended up... They didn't ever make it good. It was just like, oh, it's shit, and it's going to be shit the whole time. Yeah. Like, they've tried, sort of, failed yep. at making it better. I, got, so. I tell you, though, they better not mess up Elder Scrolls Six, or that might actually kill the company. Like, if it's yeah. that bad. Yeah if, it, yeah, if it's bad enough and people know that it's bad enough ahead of time and they don't pull a bait and switch, it might very well kill the company. Yeah, so for reference, the newest Fallout 76 DLC Wastelanders, or the free update, it's a 62 average critic score, 15% of critics recommend it. Oh, ouch. Yeah, it's not good. Yeah, that's bad. That's really bad. So, well, In fact, most of their other DLC or updates have been much better rated than this one. And even then, like, their highest, I think, was 74%. That's just rough. That's just yeah. really rough. Yeah, not a good game. Not a good game at all. It was like a just, let's see if we can make money off garbage. Yeah. Um, so moving back into the tech side, a little bit less of the gaming side now that we're in, in this segment here. Um, so, yeah, jumping into some of the other news, back into tech, we do have a little bit more Intel news here. So there is a leak of the Intel i9-10900K can you please fix your naming intel? We're getting more and more sick of this every time you do it. Uh, but there was a review that leaked that does seem to be quite legit. There's a lot of a lot of backing behind it. Now, I mean, this was an article posted by WCCF Tech, but that is not where the uh, uh, actual review comes from. I think it's a uh, Kit Guru that did it, or no, 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 not Kit Guru. It's a uh, via video cards uh, that did a, a quick review of it. Tech Lab, T E C L A B, uh, via video cards that talked about it and. Basically, if the these are correct results, it's a disappointment, which is what we all expected. It's still 14 nanometers, so what are we hoping to get? Um, so it's got a base clock of 3.7 gigahertz, uh, according to the review, which lines up to what Intel has announced on the retail sample, so that mm -hmm. makes sense. Uh, they're running super hot again, generally needing a liquid cooler. Air coolers are going to really struggle with this chip, again, expected. Now, I'm sure you could put an air cooler on it, get okay temperatures because it's not boosting as high, but you want to get the higher all-core boost. Uh, which we don't really know exactly what that is yet. We'd have to see more extensive testing to see really where the all-core on average sticks with. Uh, I don't think they even talked about all-core in this very much, but even if they did, I would wait for more chips because that can vary by chip. Not as much with Intel. Intel tends to be a little more conservative. Precision Boost Overdrive from AMD definitely varies chip to chip quite a bit. Um, anyway... The Ryzen 9 equivalents are still showing better performance in basically every compute application and uh, very slightly slower performance in most gaming applications. So I've got just, uh, uh, like, I can tell you guys a couple quick benchmarks. Uh, we've been doing this podcast for quite some time, so I'm going to try not to take up too much time uh, with you guys talking about the benchmarks. But um, Cinebench R20, the 3900X, got 7,009 points. That's the AMD Ryzen 9 3900X. The Ryzen 9 3950X, which of course is a, a uh, much higher core count, um, 16 cores, uh, got 9,406. 
and the i9-10900K got 6,314. Now, uh, you know, you might think that that's in some ways unfair because the 3900X is a 12 core, but I guess in my personal thought is if the pricing is what we expect, then that's what you compare it to. You don't compare it to the, well, they don't even have a 10 core, but you don't compare it to the, you know, an eight core or something like that. It's the price parity that matters. Um, so it's not looking great, honestly. Yeah, because mo most people pricing. don't go, I'm going to buy whatever the better company's 12 core is. Exactly, yeah. They're looking at pricing specific, yeah. which is why, like, the FX series sold so well back when AMD had the that horrible, mm -hmm. horrible chip out was because it was like, oh, well, look, this is eight cores for the same amount of money or whatever. It looked like yeah. more power. Uh, people base it a lot on price. So we'll see. You know, again, it's, it's getting really close. A lot of the gaming benchmarks were looking like, you know, really, really small FPS uh, numbers. So we've got, like, Tomb Raider uh was 118 fps on the 10 900k and 115 fps on the 3900x you know uh gta 5 actually performed better on amd uh metro exodus 62 fps versus 55 that's a little bit of the one of the, one of the bigger ones but mm -hmm. you know we see some of these games here that are only seeing a couple frames borderlands 3 78 versus 76 uh let's see assassin's creed odyssey 71 versus 65 you know it's like you're, you're still getting a little bit of a gaming lead, but that's like the only thing Intel can really hold on right now is like, okay, they can't hold on ultra portable mobile. They can't hold on high performance mobile. They can't hold on portable desktop. They can't really hold on desktop productivity uh, and they can't hold in the server market, but they can still hold in the gaming market by just the, the little last little bit there. So. For a couple months, maybe. Yeah, that's what it's looking like, unless they can get their 10, 10 nanometer out faster. <laughs> yeah. Not going to happen. Um, so the Surface Duo, uh, which I don't know if you have a heavy interest in the Duo yourself. I personally do. I have plans to buy it just because it's unique. I really like it. Um, I am, <laughs> after seeing these specs, very concerned about the battery life. I am too. I am too. So before, let's leave a teaser there. Let's not get to the battery yet. You know, I mean, I like to leave teasers to make sure people stick around, especially when we're two hours <laughs> minutes into a podcast. I assume you're definitely not sticking around at this point. Yeah, right? clearly, if you came right to this podcast, the only reason you came here was to find out the milliamp hours of the Surface Duo. Exactly. Yes. Yes. So I'm going to put that in the title. <laughs> um so as a person that likes to buy unique devices as i kind of showed earlier with the my fx tech pro one i will be buying it for the heck of it because it's an interesting device but, but you're I not gonna buy the the lg phone okay i'm not gonna buy all of them this one but the lg phone is extremely cool okay i don't know it's the same reason i would it, buy the motor the, Raider the okay. lg phone is more unique than the surface duo it is more unique but by far, so, in fact, I think hold the Surface on. Duo looks better. Hold on, I'll be right back. Hey, uh, I'm gonna go grab water since you just walked away for a sec. That's a good mark. I was supposed to do it while you were. Oh, damn it! I wanted you to All keep right. going. I was gonna pull out my Surface Duo. I hate you. <laughs> well, is it cool if I go get water? Because I'm like, how long is it gonna take? Because we're almost done. I guess we are almost done. I'm just like having trouble talking because my mouth's so dry. Okay, so so I'm gonna run down the specs here, and I want to be clear that. They don't surprise me except for the battery. <laughs> so Snapdragon 855, still a great chip. No, it's not an 855 plus or an 865. It's not the newest tech out there, but uh, my FX Tech Pro one has a Snapdragon 835 and it still feels plenty fast. Um, so I don't really have a problem with that. It has six gigs of RAM. That feels a little bit limiting for something that's supposed to be a dual screen device when you don't have enough RAM and when you're supposed to be running multiple apps at the same time. Which I feel like with two screens, you're finally going to actually want to run more than one app at a time. I mean, like, like let's be honest. How many people on iOS or Android actually use two apps at once ever? I don't ever do it. I never launch that feature. No. Like, maybe once in a while, I will specifically on the Pro 1 because I can have, like, a Excel sheet and a 
like Word doc or something open, mm-hmm. splitting on the screen with no keyboard. In well, the way. you see, if you had used the Kyocera Echo, the original Surface Duo design, yep, then do you, is, you would you understand. Do you still have the actual device? Huh? I haven't even opened this. I Are bought this. I bought this when they announced the Surface Duo. I oh, bought it off did. eBay. Oh. <laughs> Are you opening I'm, it right now? No, I'm waiting until they do another like Surface Duo drop, and then I'm going to do like a video about the original Surface Duo design, the original folding phone, because if the Surface Duo is the folding phone for some fucking reason, then this is too. Yeah, yeah, basically. That's, uh, yeah, you know, that's, that's true, because it's not really <laughs> folding, folding. Um, okay, so 6 gigs of RAM is something that does concern me, though. Now, you've got the 64 to 256 gigs of storage. Uh, you got an 11 megapixel camera and uh, f2.0 aperture, so it's probably going to be okay. And aren't uh, they releasing got... a version with no camera? I thought they said that when they first announced it. Uh, I think the Neo doesn't have a camera, which is, you know, bigger. No, I'm pretty sure but... they also announced that the phone wasn't going to... Like, there was, there was at least going to be a version of the phone without it, I think. Because, no, even if you look at the pictures they show, it doesn't have a picture of it. Oh, or there's okay. no camera on the Surface Duo they showed off. Okay, maybe they're... Not Unless that's to, talking about the front camera. It could be the front camera. That could be the front camera. I didn't see. It just said as a camera. Yeah. But anyway, uh, the screens are two uh, 5.6-inch displays at 1800 by 1350. I'm actually surprised they're as high resolution as they are. Honestly, that is pretty high res, which makes the final point here even more concerning. A 3460 milliamp hour battery. <laughs> It's so bad. That is so tiny for a device that's going to be this power hungry. I mean, you're having what 11.2 inches of screen real estate and a significant amount of pixels. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And a high end CPU. Like, so I I keep referencing it, but only because it's also a unique phone is the FX tech pro one is a 3,500 million power battery. It's running a 1080p display at 60 Hertz. And a Snapdragon 835. <laughs> I'm very concerned about something that has two displays at higher resolution and a higher end processor, mm-hmm. uh, which also includes higher end Wi Fi chips, higher end LTE chips, and stuff like that. So you're going to get the better performance. And so, like, I'm just genuinely concerned. And, like, I probably won't buy this right on launch. I'm going to wait for reviews to see if it's as bad as it seems, you know? Um, but it's definitely an interesting device. And so I'm, I'm probably going to end up buying it either way because it's really cool. But I, I feel like they maybe tried to make it too thin. And mm-hmm. so when it's open, it's going to have another bend gate fiasco, essentially. And, and that's something that I've complained about about phone manufacturers for a long time that Apple has actually stepped away from and some of the more unique brands have is stop making it thinner, make it better at the same or slightly bigger size, right? Uh, yeah. Make it fit better in the hand, make it have a bigger battery. And maybe Microsoft didn't go in that direction like they should have. But also having two separate batteries and having to split up the tech like that does add complications. So I'm not entirely surprised. But, but the right. the Galaxy Fold, which does have a battery on each side, has like a a thousand milliamp hour more battery almost. It does. Um, it's also thicker for sure. So and it's also. I don't know. Maybe there's only a battery on one side of this. Maybe that's what this is. Is a big battery in one side and the rest of the tech in the other. Maybe. Which would be weird. I don't know. It's very odd, though, and I just, I, I don't think they're going to be able to do much to make it great. Especially, again, a device that's supposed to be like a, what you would consider a really, like, pro device. Mm-hmm. like a Kind of like the Galaxy Note series, right? Where it's like, okay, you're supposed to run multiple apps at the same time on these high-res bright displays so that you can get work done. But it's going to die on you at lunchtime. Not good. Yeah. Um, and then what you mentioned about the LG Wing, that looks really interesting. And so maybe I will consider that as a phone. <laughs> yeah, it looks know, wild. Though, like, it looks wild, but I feel almost like, like, the keyboard function there, I feel almost like it's an entire screen that's just gonna be a keyboard and nothing else ever. I mean, probably. <laughs> Which, like, at that point, just make it a physical keyboard. Well, yeah, but then they can do stuff, like, swipe stuff and, like, emojis. Uh, no. And and did you see the picture? Did you see the no? Did you see the picture of the um graph, the bar graph, where the bars go down to the second screen? What are they trying to show off here? Like I don't even understand. (laughs) 
I don't know. Like, I'll put this on screen. What is that even? Like, oh, by the way, if you need to view a bar graph that so happens to only <laughs> have bars that are taller in the downwards direction in the middle of your display, <laughs> this will be able to display them. Like, what what apps are going to scale this way? <laughs> what apps is going to do that? Nothing is going to do that. I Honestly, if anything, LG has like a very specific app in-house that they somebody was like, I need this to work for some reason. And they're like, let's yeah. do it. I don't know, man. Um, I don't know. What I will say, too, is it's literally the picture of it is literally just a picture overlaid <laughs> on top of a picture yeah. of the phone. Um, now, for those that don't remember, I think it was LG. They actually had a phone like this a long time ago. It just wasn't a screen on the yeah, bottom. Yeah, yeah. Also, right. as we mentioned, you know, it was in Iron Man 1. Uh -huh. It was the phone that Tony Stark used in Iron Man 1 with the, uh, the rotating screen. I and Obadiah also had it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That was a cool phone. Yeah. Um, so they're bringing back an devices, old man. phone idea. Yeah, I mean, these, these these slabs of glass has been so boring for so long. I like to see more unique devices. Mm -hmm. Like, I really do like to see it. I mean, like, I like my OnePlus 7T Pro 5G McLaren edition. Can you please make the name longer? I, I really like that phone. It's a good phone. It, you know, the 90 hertz display is great. The 5G connectivity is actually surprisingly better than i expected it to be but it's not unique it still feels like this isn't that much different than my like s8 plus or something so yeah now you know it'd be really unique what if premiere pro got better gpu acceleration you know i don't think that's ever going to happen though that's something that oh. they've just never done yeah so uh anyway so uh amazon web service no <laughs> 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 so Adobe Premiere Pro did uh, finally add both AMD and NVIDIA hardware acceleration through NVIDIA's NVENC codec and whatever AMD's is that I keep forgetting the name of, uh, their hardware encoders. Now, this is a really big deal because DaVinci Resolve uh, and even Final Cut have been able to really take good advantage of GPU for a long time. And uh, Premiere Pro has just really, really, really suffered and honestly, I mean, I'm not a fan of Premiere Pro. I ditched the Adobe suite. I do not like their business model. I do not like monthly payments. I do not like continuous updates that always break things in applications that are unreliable for professional work. But, but this is still a step in the right direction. Render times will probably still be slower for the same types of projects versus something like DaVinci Resolve, which can have better multi-core threading along with the GPU acceleration that they're more experienced with. But I'm glad to finally see this because I do think this is going to help creators that do creation on lower end PCs that have a DGPU or laptops that have a DGPU. Mm -hmm. um, again, though, personally, just not a fan of the Adobe suite. So I'm glad they're doing this, but I also feel like Adobe has all these applications that you can send stuff through their intelligent links or whatever the hell they call it uh, from one application to another. And I'm like, why does that need to be another application when something like DaVinci Resolve has all of their effects, all of their audio work, all of their editing, all in one place, one application. You're not having to switch all this stuff and open up new apps because, like, when back when I used the Adobe Suite, and maybe it's better now, but that was only like a year and a half, two years ago. Um, anytime I tried to link stuff between apps, things would crash. Apps wouldn't open. <laughs> I would link something to another app. Like, I'm like, okay, I'm going to open this audio segment in Audition uh, from Premiere Pro to do an edit and remove some background noise. Oh, wow, it opened. It worked. This is really cool. I'm going to use this feature. The next time I do it, it opens in Audition. I make my edits, and they just don't export back into Premiere. So mm -hmm. I had to just not do it because I didn't have enough time to finish the video at that point. Um, so, or finish the audio editing. So anyway, thank you, Adobe, for doing something. Please do more to make your products not garbage. Just because you have a monopoly on the market doesn't mean that you can sit around and sit on your ass. But that's exactly what you treat it as. And this is why products like DaVinci Resolve and Final Cut Pro are getting even more popular. Yeah. Yep. So now we are in the tiny news section. Um, so being in the tiny news section here, we're going to just bullet right through these so that we can hopefully have this podcast be not much longer than two and a half hours. <laughs> <laughs> so let's start uh, with this AWS news. You go ahead. Yeah. So uh, the vice president of Amazon Web Services uh, quit very publicly because yeah. he was very upset with how Amazon was handling whistleblower complaints, specifically um, complaints about um, the warehouse conditions and how Amazon was not really doing much to uh, deal with the COVID 
problem. Which no, is... no, right. I mean, they were even still interviewing people in bulk re- bulk rooms and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I saw a picture of um one of their training classes where the chairs yeah. were like, it was like chair, 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 chair. There was no gap. Yeah. Yeah. No yeah. gaps at all. No PPE given to anyone. And it was like one row, the next row. The, like there was no yeah. room to move around, let alone Again, to... one of the richest companies on the planet. Yeah. Um, and <sighs> so it was just wild. And, um, and yeah, the way I mean, that's a bigger deal than than like the vice president, of, like Amazon's sales leaving. Mm-hmm. This is a big deal. Yeah. Yeah. AWS is what brought Amazon into profitability. Well, and I feel like it's still their core business. I don't I haven't yeah. looked at their public financials recently, but. I mean, no matter what, it's extremely, extremely important for them. Yeah, um, for sure. And so, like, and I mean, AWS is like what like half the internet operates off of. So the vice yeah. president of half the internet's infrastructure just dipped because he was yeah. so upset with how Amazon was handling this. And by handling this, we mean just doing nothing. They yeah. just pretended it didn't exist, basically. They were like, oh, look, we're going to be selling a lot more stuff. Hire people. Well, That's all. well, and then when the whistleblower complained, they fired him. And that was what brought this guy over the edge and quit. It wasn't just how the warehouse yeah. was. It was Amazon poorly handled the warehouse. Somebody publicly complained about it to try and pressure them to switch. And then they fired and then tried to smear this person. Yeah. Yeah, for that was... complaining of and being concerned about the safety of him and his co or of them and their co. Yeah. I think as a woman. You know, this leaves a little bit of concern for AWS as a whole, though, because it says something about the integrity of the vice president of AWS, which maybe that some of that's going to change now. You know, I mean, he's going to mm-hmm. have a big influence on the company, and yeah. you know, maybe there's going to be some. You know, if they hire a VP that is maybe not as I can't think of the word for integrity. So not as full of integrity. Um, mm-hmm. That's going to be potentially bad for the company. So, And apparently know. this guy was also um, the co-author of XML. <laughs> wow. That's also a really big deal. Yeah. That's used everywhere. Hey, but, you know, there's, a, there's an alternative. There's Microsoft Azure. So you can try that out. Mm-hmm. I get close to my microphone and say it because Azure is a fun name. <laughs> and because I'm tired. Because I need caffeine. No, you need to go to bed. <laughs> because. because um, eight. Yeah, so uh, Samsung has done what they do with every phone that's like three years old. And um, have dropped it from getting monthly security updates to getting quarterly security updates. I'm surprised it got monthly as long as it did, to be honest. Uh, so from my understanding, the standard practice for Android phones is two years standard practice. A lot of companies don't actually follow it is two yeah. years of core software updates and three years of security updates. Yeah. yeah. And that's what so. that's what Samsung had promised for a while was that you'd get the like two major version upgrades and three years of monthly security updates. Yeah. Um, Which, I mean, it, it, that's understandable. I mean, at that point, you're coming on time to get a new phone, you know? I mean, yes and no, though. Like, the Galaxy S8 hardware-wise well, yeah, I mean, is still a with, fine with phone. Phones getting better and better. I mean, my S8 Plus, if it weren't cracked, is still an amazing phone. Yeah. Um, you know, and the processor in it is still relevant. There's still phones made today with it. So Yeah. Um, yeah that's a good point. And so it's like, you know, that's one of the biggest things that I feel like Apple has consistently had an advantage over Android for yeah. is, like, if you buy an Android phone, it reaches the point where if you use banking apps and stuff, it's irresponsible to keep your phone after three years. Yeah, that's also true. Yeah, You should upgrade just for security purposes. For As a yeah. general consumer, you probably should upgrade after three years for that reason, even yeah. if the hardware is fine. Whereas Apple is still giving you feature updates four or five years later. Yep. Yep. That's a good point. Apple's been doing a good job with that. And that's something they, they've always done better at, though, if we're being honest. I mean, Windows is a hell of a lot better at it than, than it used to be versus Mac mm-hmm. OS is, is, you know, you, I mean, they, Microsoft hasn't always been bad about it either. I mean, they gave uh, updates for Windows 7 just ended, you know, but, um, and you can still extend it if you pay, which has always been one of the funny things to me because it's like, if you can extend it, then the code's already there. So just update it anyway. You have to put the workforce into it anyway. <laughs> But anyway, um, 
Yeah. That's yeah, but they want to push to people to do it. If they kept offering it for free, then people just wouldn't do it. Oh, yeah, I know. And then people would wait till the absolute last minute and then do it. Yeah. Whereas right now, if there's something absolutely massive that comes out for Windows 7, you know, they may still patch it just like they did for XP with WannaCry. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, because they do still have people actively working on it. So I, I guess, yeah, it makes sense. But, um, but please stop using Windows 7. Um, <laughs> especially on, like, I mean, I understand in some corporate environments using Windows 7 because it's, you know, you, you need it for software or whatever, but generally yeah. try to try to pull away from it. <laughs> At my work, they uh, they had sent out a notice that updates were going to stop, and that based on the the way our you know work is set up and everything, they were just going to charge the property the forty dollars or whatever to upgrade if we still had Windows Seven PCs in use. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that they recommended that everyone instead of like instead of like saying okay, we'll upgrade you to Windows Ten, they were just like, at this point, if you have a computer that's still running Windows Seven, you probably should just upgrade to Windows Ten. Because like yeah. our computers were, you know, they're not particularly good in the first place, so no, they're, they're ass and now. Honestly, ten is not that much better. I mean, ten is not as bad as it was when it first came out at handling lower end hardware. No, so um, if you have seven, you should just do it. Yeah, but it was it was the thing where it was like uh, they were like, yeah, you should just upgrade to when uh, to new hardware with Windows ten already installed, and our work was just like, eh, what we. we we have to wait like six months to redo the budget. So we're just going to pay the $40 now and then buy a new computer next year. And I'm like, I hate how budgets yeah. work at business. Like, it's so stupid. Oh, if yeah. you're going to literally spending more money to stay within your budget this year. What? Yeah. yeah. No, it's just weird. It's just weird. I don't know. Companies make weird decisions too, because like paying Microsoft to continue to get those security updates. It's like, if you're installing really good antivirus, something like WebRoot or something that's actually enterprise good, you're probably still relatively safe anyway. You know, Dude, our so like, antivirus is ass. It it literally uh, will cause the computers to freeze. So <laughs> I've had that happen with some enterprise antivirus before. Um, for those that don't know, I do work in like the enterprise IT world. Um, but it's less common. It's a lot. This is common. every single day at one o'clock. It runs its virus yeah. scan, and the laptop that we're using that is brand new uh, freezes. I have had it happen with <laughs> one computer one time with this enterprise piece of software so yeah um it's like it's it's well more well built there but are they using do you know what antivirus is being used is it something i don't that's remember like I, no, or something? it's nothing good. no it's it's like probably just shitty consumer stuff i don't think it's anything okay at that point just fucking um, turn on windows defender just turn on I, defender and get rid of your horror i know game. that i'm not no, in charge no i know you know that i'm just like it's frustrating because if you're not going to use the really high-end enterprise antivirus that actually is better than defender you're better off just using defender yeah <laughs> oh, um whatever however if you don't care about pcs at all and you just want to game on your phone which who actually does that but that's irrelevant uh, media tech has a new chipset for you if you have um, so, the FX Tech Pro One, it's easier to game on your phone. <laughs> they are uh, they call this the Helio G eighty five. So this is an eight core. Um, however, normally when we've seen eight core chips, I feel like it's consistently been four big and four small cores. Maybe I've been wrong with Android as of recent, but I think no, it's I think been that's that. Mostly what we've seen, we've seen six cores where it'll be like two big and four little, but eight yeah. usually four big, um, and four little. But what they're doing here is four big and four little. And the four big cores are clocked at two gigahertz, and the six, or sorry, the two big cores are uh, two gigahertz, and the six small cores are 1.8 gigahertz. Interesting. Yeah. And then um, their GPU is clocked at one gigahertz. That's interesting. So it should be pretty good for gaming. Um, again, yeah. I don't know who really, like, Goes well, hardcore with games on GPU. Well, not in the American market, I guess. Yeah. Right? But uh, you've got the GPU and the higher end cores capable of, um, you know, handling the game and your background tasks still being operated by the more efficient cores in the background. So I mean, yeah. I think it makes sense. I mean, and adding more of those more efficient cores should allow more things in the background to run without as much mm -hmm. of a hitch. And maybe game devs can fully take advantage of that at some point too. I don't know. Yeah. Um, so more Microsoft stuff, since we kind of segued into them a moment ago. Uh, Microsoft <laughs> is working on ending 32-bit support for Windows 10. Uh, this is not something that's happening right away. In fact, I don't think we really have an official date yet. Uh, I'll check the website. Honestly, I forgot that they even still supported it. <laughs> they do. They do. It's absolutely amazing. Uh, starting with build 2004, 
which is coming up, uh, they are changing the minimum hardware requirements to be 64 bit. It's about time. I don't know why anybody, I mean, I, I hope nobody is running Windows 10 on a 32 bit system because I feel really bad for you. Um, but it is supported still until here soon. <laughs> mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, and then Microsoft's president, Brad Smith, has admitted that they were wrong about open source being a cancer, as the old CEO <laughs> said long ago. Uh, well, he's which, busy owning a basketball team now and not involved in computing, so that's a good thing. Yes, yes, indeed. So, you know, I'm not surprised at all by this. Honestly, Microsoft has been going more towards the open source direction, both with stuff you've seen from Xbox of just trying to be more cross-platform, not necessarily open source, but cross-platform. But then also the fact of like Windows subsystem for Linux, uh, a lot of other Windows aspects have been trying to, you know, Windows is so close source, of course, but uh, Windows subsystem for Linux, uh, Microsoft's also running a lot of Linux in their data centers and stuff now instead of just Microsoft's Windows stuff. And I think it makes a ton of sense, actually. Well and with the acquisition of GitHub, they've actually done a good job of maintaining it. So GitHub has remained awesome. There has not had to be an alternative put up to avoid it. Microsoft has yeah. done a great job there, and they're seeing the benefits of it. And I'm not going to say that Windows will ever go open source. I don't think that's going to happen, uh, or at least not Windows Server. But what I will say is in my personal experience of using a lot of Linux and a lot of Windows uh, systems, in particular for servers, um, Linux is so much more reliable. There's There's already enough of a point there for going with an open source project that is heavily reliable uh, versus going with Microsoft's closed source. Because honestly, like, I mean, mm -hmm. Linux just doesn't have problems. Yeah. <laughs> um, and anyway, yeah, I'm, I'm glad that they have talked about that and we'll see what else comes of it. Yeah. Um, it's interesting. I just will have to see more of what they do. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't think they're going to do a ton of open source stuff, but I don't know. I mean, the new Power Toys is on GitHub, so. Yeah. And who knows? Maybe they'll start making some interesting open source applications. I don't know. And Edge is running on Chromium, so it's mostly open source. Yeah. So, I mean, they're, 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 yeah. they are taking active steps in that direction. Um, now, if you want to talk about opening things up to um, more platforms, we can talk about how Spotify spent at least 100 million, potentially up to 200 million I've seen to buy exclusive rights to the Joe Rogan podcast. I'm just personally, ouch. It's like, so much money. Okay, so I just want to jump in here and tell you guys that I won't ever sell out. <laughs> but, uh, and I mean, depending on whether or not you really even consider this a sellout, but I don't personally like it. Um, I don't know, it just, it just feels weird for a creator to be able to be bought. You know, not just sponsored, but bought because <laughs> that, that's what this is. You know, I mean, we, we people call creators shills for taking a sponsor spot for a related product that they've done a dedicated review on already. And Joe Rogan was like, yeah, you can buy me like, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um, it's definitely a weird thing. And like for me personally, when I've generally watched, cause like I don't watch every episode, they're super long, but they're usually pretty good. Um, yeah. but when I have watched them, I, or when I have you know, gone to pay attention to them. They're generally something that I actually like having the video up on the side for. Like um, some of the yeah. interactions that they'll have, you actually want to see. And so like, it's, I know Spotify has like some basic video stuff, but they don't really use it for anything well, actually important. Like, and so like, I'm, separate sorry, from ahead. all the other issues, like, am I going to be able to like open Spotify on my computer and watch it? Or are they just getting rid of the video? Right, because, like, imagine having to only listen to Elon Musk smoke weed. <laughs> right? <laughs> that would be horrible. <laughs> yeah. Who would want to listen to that? I know, right? You got to watch that. You got to witness yeah. it. So, I don't know. It's, it's that I Maybe Spotify is going to try and work towards a video side of things. I don't know. But yeah, I've not been the biggest fan of Spotify, period, anyway, because they, I mean, they're not horrible. They're by far not the worst in the industry, but they don't really pay their creators that well. Uh, the musicians and stuff. To, to well, yeah, they got to have that Joe Rogan money. Right, right, exactly. Like, we ain't going to pay the creators the money they deserve. We're going to buy other creators. I don't yeah. know. I don't like the being bought out thing. I just don't. I don't like that Ninja got bought out by Mixer. Uh, there was somebody that got out by Twitch recently or YouTube to stream exclusively. A lot, there. A lot of game streamers have been getting bought out as of recent. Yeah, and I'm not... Um, and I'm not you and I talked about this before the show, but, like, for me, it's, it's one thing when... Um, you know, a platform pays to get something made. 
Yeah. You know, if, if Spotify yeah. was making a new podcast with Joe Rogan, like a separate yeah. one, yeah. that'd be uh-huh. cool. Whatever. Um, but they're just essentially paying to lock him out of other stuff. Yeah. Yeah. That, it's like, that's, that's the difference there is it's one thing when something is new and you lock it to your platform from the get go. It's different <clears> when you are like anybody that watched Joe Rogan on whatever their favorite podcast sort wow i can't talk whatever their favorite podcast source was is completely screwed now and they have to use spotify Mm -hmm. and it's like okay is the expectation that everybody's just supposed to have spotify because that's already a monopolistic move that i don't want i mean spotify's already gone that way they've bought out several podcast platforms and so have other podcast services no for sure i mean i i get it you know and i mean they just i i would like more competition but of course their business model was built on free with ads and that's part of why they're as big as they are today but um I, I don't know. I don't know. I we just, are reaching a point like where it. podcasts are going the route of um, like shows where they are yeah, such a, uh-huh. a big and important thing that now at this point, we are going to see them move towards um, specific platforms, unfortunately. Yeah. And I don't like that. I'm not one to go out and pay more to use another platform. I'm trying to join my media. Like that's my big thing with Plex and why I use Plex despite some of its bugs with its title integration is um i just want to i want my movies i want my podcast i want my tv shows i want my music i want everything in the same place um and i don't want to have to go buy another source in order to listen to a specific creator i'm not a fan of mm-hmm. that uh, or watch a specific creator and this this is and what what he was saying what dan was saying about about like something that's new is like i don't have a problem with linus tech tips who started float playing putting up exclusives there that is their service that they started exclusive and it's their content that's going on there exclusive um but you know i mean i i i wouldn't like if they just stopped posting on youtube right but um it's different when it's something that you created or something that's new Mm -hmm. so i don't know not a fan however speaking of new things there is a new yeah there is a new uh sd express standard um so the SD Association has announced a new standard for SD cards that is ridiculously fast. Um, so its transfer rate yeah. is uh, 3,938 megabytes per second. So nearly four gigabytes per second transfer rate. It's a lot. Um, it's and fast. the way that they achieve this is um, using the PCI Express 4 and NVMe standards. So, yeah, so NVMe so, SD cards. We're reaching a point where a phone with an SD card might get NVMe before the Android phone itself uses NVMe storage. You know what's going to be funny is when people uh, sideload apps onto the SD card because it's faster. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, so for those that don't know, iPhones use NVMe and have for several years. They have since the 6S. Yeah, it's like four years now. Yeah, Yeah, Yeah. since the 6S. Um, and Android phones, not a single one still does. Apple built their right. own NVMe controller to make it work. No Android phones. You know phones how have they it. always say that Android phones slow down over time, and that's one of the things that sucks about them? Uh huh. That is because it doesn't have as fast as storage. You fill it up more, it does slow down marginally because of being filled up, but it, you also just don't have as fast as storage. So when you have more stuff that's trying to run more things in the background, and you have to overflow some of your RAM, which Android is, is much more of a RAM hog than iOS, of course, but when you have to start to overflow that into page file, virtual memory that's running on the internal storage, that slows everything down. You know, it mm-hmm. doesn't just slow down the RAM, then that storage is being used for running other stuff. So then you all of a, all of a sudden run into a situation where you have to uh, have apps load slower and stuff like that mm-hmm. too. And I just don't know why Android hasn't gone that direction. Android's running Linux. Linux does support NVMe. So I don't really, I haven't researched it a ton. So maybe there's a reason, but I don't really understand. Why. I feel like it's something that would have to come from the chipset maker My is my guess. Um, that could be, it could be, but it's probably um, one of those Qualcomm things Qualcomm. where until Qualcomm gets around to doing it, which Qualcomm doesn't have competition, so they don't care. They don't get around to doing anything. Qualcomm just doesn't innovate. Like they don't do <laughs> no. anything special. I don't know. Like they release a slightly faster chip. That's also more power hungry every year. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They're literally like, well, we can tick the clock speeds up and change the <laughs> at this number. point. Honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if like it eventually came out that like for like five years, all they've done was slightly overclock the same chip. I mean, uh, we know this. I know that that's not the case. Yeah, like, but, but, like, it wouldn't surprise me. Like, okay, I've referenced it a lot in this podcast, but this running the Snapdragon 835 does not feel much slower than the 855 Plus that I'm running here in my McLaren Edition OnePlus. And that's where I'm just like, okay, 
it's just not that big of a difference. And I mean, the OnePlus feels significantly faster in terms of like the refresh rate, right? Like in terms of the responsiveness, but in terms of just app loading or like installing apps in the background while I'm doing other stuff, I haven't had a problem on this phone. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where it's just funny. And we just keep seeing these massive spec bumps, but the CPU itself hasn't been getting that big of a spec bump. The GPU has actually gotten better from them, but it's the CPU side of things that hasn't really changed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, I think this is going to be really good, though, this new uh, standard for cameras. Um, yeah. You know, we've seen, you know, more and more cameras have to use um, SSDs. Um, yeah. And that would, if this standard wasn't coming with such high quality, then that would be something that we would see more of as we see, you know, rumors of Panasonic potentially dropping an 8K camera. Yeah. Maybe this is how they make it work. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah, I don't know. It's, um... It'd be kind of nice yeah but um that was our last topic um that was it yeah yeah I, well, watch the gh6 have this i mean i'll still record all my stuff to ssds but i would not be surprised if the gh6 whenever that does launch is including this is like i the camera the launch camera for this tech maybe since maybe. the standard was just finalized though i don't know if they have time I don't know how fast SD card standards move. Yeah, I'm not really sure. Like, I'm thinking, because what I'm saying is I wouldn't be surprised either way, but like. Because especially since it uses PCI Express 4 to work, I that's, highly. That's a good point. I yeah. highly doubt whatever chip that they're putting in there is set up for PCI 4. It's an Intel 7700 <laughs> with custom silicon so that it supports PCI 4. So it's gonna have like a a one second record time battery no, life. The more, imp the more important part is that um, is the first Intel chip to support PCIe 4.0. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, yeah. Um, we'll see if anything good comes from it. Google, yeah. get your shit in gear, please. It'd be really nice. Yeah. Bye. Not gonna happen. Not gonna happen. Well, that but is it for Wordcast 72. Um, do you have anything else to add, or are we good? Not about tech. All I was gonna say is both of us kind of uh, need to get in the swing of podcasting again. It's been such a while, uh, such a long time that I feel like I've been like rambling more than I used to, even though we used to do it later. I don't think um, we've been rambling too much. I think we packed a lot of well, news into it. I shouldn't say yeah. rambling. I should say uh, fumbling words. <laughs> oh, okay. I get you. I get you. I feel like I don't feel like you've been too bad at that. I feel like I've been relatively okay, but maybe that's just because I have a new microphone and I can hear my sex. <laughs> I don't know. I just feel like before, like we were pretty good about never doing it. Yeah. And it's just like yeah, it's the so. first time that both of us have, you know, had to essentially talk for two and a half hours straight. Three. In a while. Three hours, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I know that's true. So I mean, yeah, but uh the plan is to start doing a lot more podcasting, so uh I will I will throw that in there as you guys can expect to see a lot more from us. So yep. um and lots of new videos to come on the channel too. So I'm not gonna throw any hints at what they are because we only have 10 minutes before we hit the three hour mark, which is insane. <laughs> yeah, that's not happening. I need to go to bed. I have to get yeah, up in I need to go to bed. less than eight hours. Yep. Well, anyway, thank you everybody for watching uh, or listening. If you're listening, this will be on various podcast sources. We're going to try and get it to as many as we can. So whatever your preferred way of listening is. just Spotify exclusive. Yep. That's that's going to be the headline tomorrow is uh, a word tech, <laughs> uh, WordCast from Word Tech Reviews has been bought out for $10 million dollars for Spotify exclusive podcast. Yo, if they offer you 10 million tomorrow, you have to do it. I don't even care about your integrity. We can start a second podcast. Actually, I completely agree with that, <laughs> but it's not going to happen. First. I get an email. From well, now right that now. you've said it. Right, right. Yeah, now that I've said it. Hey, like I said, I wouldn't sell out, but. Hey, clearly nice. really long podcasts are what Spotify wants. So. I mean, that's true. Okay, so what, what I will say is, you know, I know I said I wouldn't sell out, but <laughs> also. If I go from making like, you know, nothing to a hundred dollars in a month to ten million dollars, I'd probably do it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'd be so mad at you if you were offered ten million right now and you said no. He's like, no, my integrity is better than that. And it's like, bruh, you don't even have a huge audience yet. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, thank you everybody for watching. We'll we'll see you all in the next one, which uh, should be next week. And um, I hope you're all doing well and safe in this horrible time that we're kind of stay home through. stay safe stay home stay safe stay home save lives <laughs>